Our first speaker this morning will be uh, Dr. Ashok Chanda from the University of Minnesota. And he will, as usual, be discussing uh, Solborn diseases. All right. Good morning, everyone. Again, thank you for showing up this morning, although you didn't need to drive, but uh, you know we missed this personal interaction. And I hope to see everybody in person next year, right? I think it's uh, finally we're uh, getting really bored of the Zoom interactions here. Uh, today, you know, primarily I'm going to focus on rhizoctonia management in sugar beet, you know, but there are a few things that I could touch upon if, you know, if needed at the end. Again, uh, I'm the extension sugar beet pathologist with University of Minnesota. I'm located at the Northwest Research and Outreach Center in Crookston. Um, here's my contact information. And uh, if you have any questions, you know, later uh, after this talk or any time. So first thing I always wanted to show you some data is like uh, the number of samples that we receive uh, in Crookston for disease diagnosis, right? So number one thing, we just need to know what's happening to the beets in our fields, right? So we can't just assume, we just need to verify, we need to pull a sample and diagnose in the lab. And again, in 2020, we got about 89 samples and rhizoctonia was kind of the major one we saw. This is the same trend since 2014. So the highest number of samples are always rhizoctonia. And we did see some ephanomyces. Again, it's not uncommon to see ephanomyces in some fields, especially you know, if you have some uh, moisture issues or a little bit later planting or it's a weak variety. And then there are at least few fields that had both rhizoctonia and ephanomyces. And then the number of samples for physiarium was a little bit uh, down in 2020. That's really good news because, you know, we saw a spike in 2019. That was a little bit worrisome. But right now, the only thing that we can do for physiarium is actually planting a tolerant variety. So that's very good. And we do see some pythium in, in very few fields. Again, if there is some water logging or poor drainage issues, you know, pythium could be a uh, good pattern in those fields. And there are some we don't recover any pathogens. I know mostly it's because of some herbicide injury or uh, some other you know, biotic stress or abiotic stress in that case, like a wind injury uh, and other causes there. Again, in 2021, we will have the, the diagnosis set up for the growers. So if you have uh, any issues in the field, please uh, send them to our lab. The only difference is probably Maybe early summer, uh, if people are not allowed into the building, we'll have a drop box just outside the lab, just like last year. So you could drop in the samples and text me. So we'll get to them right away. Again, to emphasize this, you know, why we need this accurate diagnosis, right? For a perfect example, you know, I field uh, south of Crookston a few years ago, the grower thought that he was dealing with rhizoctonia. So next time around, he planted beets but he wanted to try two different varieties here, you know, for his own curiosity. So it ended up to be physarium, not really rhizoctonia, right? So now we see which variety did better compared to the other one. So this one did extremely well compared to the susceptible variety. Again, that's why, you know, it's very uh, essential to know what's killing beets uh, in our fields. And like as we saw earlier, sometimes it's just one, but sometimes it's a mix, but that's a real problem. You know, rhizoctonia, it's getting to be very common in most of the fields, but from time to time, uh, it gets complicated with the presence of phanomyces or physarium. You know, this particular field was in Mindag growers uh, area, and then it had both rhizoc and phanomyces. And look at the date here, right? July 21st and 2015. So, you know, most of the beets are gone like in a couple of weeks after I took this picture. Again, when you're dealing with more than one, probably have to focus with what's your biggest problem, but then you need to add different layers, how you're going to manage the other problems uh, on top of that. When we think about rhizoctonia, you know, it's a, it's a full season pathogen. It really starts from the time we put the seed in the ground because you know it could kill before they even emerge out of the ground. We call that a pre-emergence damping off. But once uh, you know, typically we see this necrosis at the soil line, and pretty soon we lose the seedlings. But anything that delays emergence, like in the you know, sometimes we don't have enough moisture right when we plant, you know, uh, then it leads to later emergence some of these uh, young plants are more susceptible compared to the older plants early on. Mm -hmm. 
but as we go later into the season, you know, it's very tricky, right? Everything is underground. So how do we know that we have Rhizoctonia there or some other root rot going on? So we just need to pick up a you know nice warm afternoon and then probably you know first thing to look up for this the wilting right and uh, some plants look healthy but right next to is actually you're seeing this uh, wilting but you're not seeing any chlorosis so it just tells you that probably the root rot is just getting started but oftentimes there are a couple of dead plants and especially in the case of rhizoctonia because these got infected early on and then you know you lost those and you're seeing some active rot in on these particular plants but once the infection gets really heavy you know what you do is you get this uh, chlorotic crowns they collapse they just uh, fall close to the ground but these are from my inoculated plots so i don't want to see any of your fields looking like this for rhizoctonia then that's really terrible to do that but by the end of the season, uh, again, you lose these plants. Uh, they just kind of look like spiders, right? We know all you have is, you know, dried up petiole there, nothing else really, you know, most of the root is gone. So that's again, classic symptom for rhizoctonia. When you see this, uh, typically you see, you know, four to five plants uh, within a row. Uh, it's not just one or two isolated cases, you know, that's the way rhizoctonia moves. Initially, it starts developing as the soil gets warm, but you know, I think there is a critical mass for it. You know, once it gets to a certain stage, you know, it can actually kill the beets. That's when we see the beets dying up and down the row here. And if you look at the roots, uh, the classic feature for rhizoctonia again, you see these very dark black necrotic lesions on the roots. Uh, sometimes you can think they are like a ladder because you see one here, one here, they go up and down the roots. But there are some theories, right? Okay, some people see maybe only at the top, some at the bottom, some in the middle, but you know, we saw all of those situations here. In this particular case, you know, it's really clean at the crown and also it's clean towards the very bottom. And then you see significant rotting here. In another situation, again, there is good rotting just down below, but the crowns look uh, more clean. But this is the case with this Roundup Ready Beach because now we are doing less and less cultivation Although looking at the survey earlier, I think more of you are doing at least one or two uh, passes for uh, take caring of the weeds. But when you do that, the soil will get into the crowns and probably you know, that's uh, very good for uh, increasing the risk for rhizoctonia. But the other point here is uh, depending on your uh, cultivation and tillage practices, you know, the depth of rhizoctonia inoculum could vary from field to field. Let's say if it's present, you know, at the, just below four inches, then you, you may see the disease developing very severely at this point, but eventually it could move up or down from the uh, location there. But once these beets die, typically what they form are these dormant structures. Uh, we call these as a sclerotia. It just looks like a soil and uh, it can survive in soil for two to three years. So that way, you know, at least a three year rotation is very good for uh, sugar beets from beets to beets. And for some of the data that I'm going to show in my talk, so basically the root rot, uh, we used to use zero to seven scale until last year, but in September, 2020, uh, we changed to zero to 10, because this is nice. You know, each point is like a 10% increase in the root rot severity. So one, when you hit 10, it's almost 90 to 100. It's a completely uh, dead plant, right? The challenge with rhizoctonia is two. Number one, if we have severe disease, we're going to lose stands. We get a lot of root rot. Number two, if you put any beets beyond five, it's going to cause significant problems during storage. So you're going to lose more money in, in your second or third payment, you know, as you get uh, towards the end. So some key points, right? Uh, rhizoctonia, when we think about rhizoctonia, it has several different groups, but primarily we are only concerned with AG2-2. There are two subgroups in 2-2, those are 3B and 4, but really doesn't matter in our growing area. Both are equally be, uh, capable of killing beets. And AG4 used to be very common for causing seedling damping off, but I would say predominantly we are dealing with AG2-2 in our growing area here. And when it comes to this host range, it's very wide for rhizoctonia. The sugar beet is pretty good host. And soybeans and edible beans. I think from the survey, I see soybean was a prob uh, problematic before uh, sugar beets uh, for rhizoctonia. And even some of the weeds that are common in 
uh, soybean, sugar beet, and corn, you know, everything in the rotation, these are good hosts for rhizoctonia. Like I said, it can survive in the soil for two to three years. The main difference between rhizoctonia and aphanomyces is when you have a field with aphanomyces, it's more or less uh, uniform. You have extensive patches because it makes these swimming spores that could actually spread within a field. Whereas rhizoctonia, it's stationary. Like I said, you know, it has to go up and down the row. You know, it just gradually increases. So it's very patchy if you have like a very severe infection and then completely clean patch right next to it. And we talked about the inoculum depth, depending on your tillage or uh, cultivation practices, uh, it can determine you know, how deep you have the rhizoctonia and where the disease shows up. And really anything that you take care to reduce the buildup of inoculum, it's really good. You know, next time you have beets around, you know, it's completely clean and you probably need to do very minimal management for rhizoctonia. So when we talk about rhizoctonia management, uh, there are several different tactics that we always talk about, but we're just gonna look at this uh, one by one. You know, early planting, it's really up to the mother nature. You know, if you could go in early and plant, that's really good for the beets because then the soil is cooler and the beets are off to a good start. When it comes to crop rotation, uh, we see soybeans and dry beans are probably more problematic compared to corn. So here, exactly just like sugar beets, it starts the time you put the seed in the ground with soybeans. It can cause pre-emergence damping off, or once you know the seedlings emerge, you can see significant root rot towards the bottom, you know, on the roots. It's just like the root rot. And this is the inoculated trial that's done in 2018. So these actually had uh, soybeans and rhizoctonia inoculum was put in the furrow. We lost about 90 to 95% of the stands because you know we also got one inch rain right after planting. So that's like a perfect storm. Where these rows are non-inoculated with rhizoc, I mean you see good emergence. And for 2019, again we repeated the same study, but here we lost about probably you know well, 40 to 50 percent of the stands. And then again, these two are inoculated. Like I said, if the weather conditions are really favorable. Uh, it can take a big toll uh, on seedling uh, emergence. And navy beans. Looking at the navy beans, here we actually broadcast the inoculum when we planted this, the same AG group that we uh, use for sugar beets. Again, you see a row of plants dying here. Again, probably some are delayed uh, for emergence here compared to the strong plant here. But you here you're seeing two more dead plants right next to it. Again, the same pattern. Some of the later emerge seedlings are more susceptible when it comes to uh, navy beans. Again, these two are, you know, some of the early emerge ones very strong and you see this chlorosis and then you're going to lose this seedling. So whether it's the soybeans or dry beans, the other thing to consider is uh, anything that you can do to manage rhizoctonia, whether it's a specialty variety or doing some fungicide application or the seed treatment, uh, that's going to be good for sh sugar beets because when you go to the beets in two to three years, uh, it's free of inoculum there. And I want to switch gears and talk about at planting fungicides. And number one is the seed treatments, right? So since 2014, we got several seed treatments that are labeled for managing rhizoctonia, but most of those belong to one class of fungicide. It's called uh, SDHI succinate dehydrogenase inhibitor. So what they do is they inhibit a single enzyme that's involved in respiration. It's almost like uh, choking that fungus, right? But the good news, most of them look very good. So again, I listed some of the treatments here. The main ones I say are Cabina or Vibrans or Cystiva, some of the labeled rates, and Metlock Sweet also comes in a different combination, whether it's Cabina or Vibrans. Again, metlock sweet is not an SDHI. It's a combination of a you know, triazol and then rhizolex here. So I'm just going to show some data for the C treatments from uh, 2020 in Crookston location. So I did not separate these, but you now you're seeing everything as a group. The number of plants for 100 foot of row on the Y axis and the days of planting on the X axis here and my untreated. So there was nothing on the seed. And this trial was inoculated with rhizoctonia at the time of planting. 
So early on, uh, surprisingly, you know, normally I don't see this pattern, but there was some reduced emergence with the C treatments at you know two weeks and three weeks, but not really much different compared to the untreated control. But once we hit about uh, 10 weeks, then you could see the little bit steeper. We are losing more and more plants towards the end of the season. So this is uh, in terms of the stand counts. Uh, moving on to the infero fungicides. I see probably at least a couple of growers are doing some infero fungicides. Uh, but again, my message for applying infero fungicides is if you have a really severe field for rhizoctonia, do it. Otherwise, you know, you're uh, probably not going to get much benefit out of the infero fungicides. And uh, two things I want to emphasize. Number one, it's actually done uh, down a drip tube in the furrow. And number two, the way we do is uh, we mix uh, fungicide in three gallons of water and mix with three gallons of 1034O, and then it goes via drip tube, right? That's the way it's basically six gallons uh, per acre. That's the right. And number two, there are several different options for infero fungicides, but the main thing is uh, some mix very well, some they don't mix very well. But the key is you need to have a constant agitation in the tank. You know, that's the key. We can't let that sit in the tank overnight and then go in the next morning and do it. It's, it's just going to have some big headaches uh, when you do that. Again, 1034O by itself and several different options that I have. So this uh, presentation is being recorded and also I'll make these slides available so you could uh, go back and see later if you need to get back. And some of the data that I will show primarily, you know, Quadris uh, is the number one choice, mostly for managing rhizoctonia. That's a nine and a half fluid ounce. Asteroid formulation at 5.7. This is equivalent to nine and a half. Elate is 7.1. It's very similar to the Quadris component uh, is similar to that. And it has SDHI. And Xanthin is a combination of headline and the biological here. You got a preaxer, proline, and propulse. Propulse is a combination of proticonazole and flopiram. And also, you know, several growers were asking how about we reduce the rate of quadris on top of the cabin of 14 grams. So I included this treatment not to encourage you to do it because, you know, ideally I want you to use nine and a half fluid ounce, but I'm just going to show the, some data, you know, how, how it looks. Because you know we have some rhizoctonia isolates with reduced sensitivity to azoxystrobin, at least in the lab, but they they are still uh, efficacious under field conditions. But it's not ideal to use a lower rate. So looking at the data for the infero treatments, again uh, I overlaid my infero treatments, the black bar with the dots on top of the previous data that I showed in 2020. Normally, I see a little bit of stand reduction with infero fungicides compared to the seed treatments, but, but the pattern is different in 2020. So the stands looked good and a little bit higher uh, from all the way from three weeks to nine weeks. And then we saw some drop in the stands from about nine to 10 weeks, but you know, compared to the seed treatments, see how steeper it is. You know, we lost some, but probably about 10 beats for a uh, hundred foot of row for inferos. So once you get these beats off to a good start, the inferos actually offer better protection onwards towards the mid part of the season. Again, you can look at these numbers if you read uh, later. And for the, some of the same treatments, uh, this is my recoverable sucrose per acre, right? So basically this is in pounds per acre here, untreated control towards the lower end and all my C treatments are towards the lower end here, right? So the stands are better early part of the season, but by the time we went to the harvest, we saw more root rot in the C treatment only. And then some of the best treatments are on the top here, right? So Quadris, this is, you know, always we talk about nine and a half fluid ounce or Xanthian or Asteroid Elatus. And this is the Quadris six fluid ounce and Cabina, right? It, it looks very similar. So all these bars share the same letter A. So in terms of statistics, there is no significant difference. So you can say everything performed well and similar 
you know, that's way. But as you add more letters, A, B, A, B, C, so that just shows that, you know, it's just going down in terms of the ranking, you know, the way you say it. So ideally, you know, any one of these options will be very good if you want to do an infra application. But again, you see the risk. If you just rely on the C treatments, if you have enough disease pressure, you're going to lose some of the recoverable sucrose here. So let's look at some post-emergence fungicides. Again, right, so the cost really depends on you know, where you're buying these fungicides. So that's why I'm not gonna say exactly it will cost you this much, right? Because some of you have only 200 acres, some of you have 500 acres. So uh, you do the math. But this is some of the data from 2020. So I'll also show you the previous data so you can compare. Um, but one thing I wanna point out in 2020, so when we talk about post-fungicides, I'm always talking about applying these as a seven inch band. You know, none of these are done as a broadcast, but there is only one broadcast. This is again, for a comparison purpose, because ideally we, I want you to do a broadcast, uh, sorry, band application. So my untreated control here, this is the zero to 10 rating. So we got about four at the time we harvested this. And this is the number of roots that had some disease, right? It could be one or 10. So there are 94% of the beets that we harvested have some rhizoctonia on them. Uh, the other things to point out, so quadris, you know, we've been using for a long time, but the elatus is, I think, going forward. That's what the recommendation from Syngenta because it's a combination of quadris and an SDHI, the same SDHI that uh, we, uh, uh, no, it's not available uh, for other uh, fungicides for sugar beet. It's, it's very unique. And then asteroid is uh, 9.2. This is the equivalent rate for this. And quadris at 10 fluid ounce rate, a little bit lower. 14 and a half is the recommended one. Excalia, it is a new SDHI fungicide that's available from Valent. It's just got labeled in 2020. And then 0.64 fluid ounce. This is a seven inch band rate. If you are going to do a broadcast, you need to do three times of this because this is for 22 inch rows. So you need to use two fluid ounce for Excalia and top guard EQ. It's a combination of flutriophol and azoxystrobin. And then you can see the quad is broadcast. So it's really high disease. And then most of these treatments in blue, you know, statistically, these are very similar. You know, they have uh, very little to some disease. And then uh, some of the treatments towards the bottom of the list are propyls, proline, and preax, right? You got about 40 to 50 or 79% of the beads here, right? So the more root rot rating, the more loss you have. But really, these are the numbers here for my yield. Uh, same treatments here. And then nickel to sucrose per acre. 2020, the growing season was really good. You know, we got these rain events from you know, July and August, constant rain. We saw some of the worst sarcospora, I think in the last six years in this growing area. But again, the, the conditions are also good for sugar beet growth. Again, these treatments, everything in blue uh, did very well, you know, asteroid or top guard in Excalia all the way up to, you know, quadris broadcast. But one thing to notice, right? So I got this, uh, Quadris band versus broadcast, just a little bit lower here. Again, preaxer and propuls, they do work, but you know, statistically they're a little bit lower compared to the treatments I got here, right? So there's a very good response from the post fungicides in 2020. So some of the treatments are common uh, in 2017 compared to 2020. Again, my untreated control Again, at 23 tons uh, per acre, the recoverable sucrose is about 7,300. The asteroid and a quadris, again, all of these are applied as a band, uh, top cut or pro line and quadris broadcast, right? See, this is the difference I talked about. The numerically, statistically, it's very similar, but you could see about 600 pounds band versus broadcast. You know, that's, that's the difference. So I keep getting this question, well, can I do broadcast? Yes, you can do the broadcast, but don't expect to have the maximum benefit when you do a broadcast application with Quadris. But somehow in 2017, the 10 ounce rate was not as great compared to the 14. You know, it's even lower compared to the broadcast here. So the band for 10 fluid ounce. 
So that's why if you have a severe field for rhizoctonia, I would still recommend going with the 14 fluid ounce or 14 and a half uh, for, uh, as a band application. Again, some of the treatments from 2019, excellent disease pressure for rhizoctonia, untreated, about 12 tons. But you know, we all know the 2019 fall, right? We can never forget. We got so much rain, uh, we couldn't even harvest uh, for more than like two months. So again, Quadris was one of the top treatments. Elatus did very good. Again, all these in the blue font are statistically very similar. Again, if you see the trend, you know, Quadris broadcast is towards the bottom here. Again, Proline and Propulse, Quadris at lower rate and it looked a little bit better in 2019. So number one, do a band application if you wanna do post. And then in the coming slide, we'll look at some of the timings for this post application. Um, we have another trial that's been done in uh, Crookston, Wapiton, and then Renville. So we looked at two different varieties. One is 3.7. So I consider this as a specialty variety for Rhizoc. And the 4.4 .4 is a susceptible variety. Right? I know some of the ratings differ between the co-ops, but Please compare, you know, how it uh, relates to the varieties from Mindac here, right? So we got three treatments at the time of planting, nothing on the seed or no infero fungicide, only cystiva on the seed or quadris infero on cystiva. That's nine and a half, right? That's the recommended rate to do it. This particular trial was planted on May 7. You know, it's very similar to when the growers would plant. And there are two different times for post emergence application, four leaf and eight leaf. So treatments had either four or eight, but not both here. June 9, June 22nd, it was harvested on September 16. So looking at some of the stands, uh, number of plants on the y-axis and then days after planting, the 3.7 did a little bit better numerically compared to the susceptible one, but we know that real resistance for rhizoctonia is not going to be effective until the beets reach six to eight leaf but the statistical differences are not there between these two varieties, so it doesn't really matter, right? So even though numerically it's higher. And when we looked at the at planting treatments, here is my untreated, nothing on the seed or infero, basically lower number of plants uh, from three to seven weeks after planting, but cystivo or cystivo and quadris infero, no, both of them did very well. But from here to here, you could see that, you know, the infero, I think some of the benefits you're seeing compared to cystio only because you're going to lose more, more plants if you just rely on the seed treatments there. And looking at the overall difference between 3.7 and 4.4, uh, basically we had more disease in the susceptible one by the end of the season um, and less uh, sucrose percentage and the recoverable sucrose per ton is actually lower for the susceptible one and higher for the resistant, just because we had a uh, higher disease. About 26% of the roots uh, in the resistant one compared to 41% in the susceptible one, right? This is just the variety comparison. But I showed you the stands a little bit higher for cystiva and cystiva and quad is compared to untreated, but in terms of the final yield, there was no difference among these treatments. So none of these are statistically different. The biggest difference we saw at this site was actually for post-emergence applications. So prior to the seed treatments, uh, we tried to time our post applications when the soil temperature at the four inch reached 65, right? But these were the two application times for 2020, four leaf on June 9, and the eight leaf application on June 22nd, right? So we are well above this threshold line when we applied this, right? This is where uh, probably by June 1st itself, uh, we crossed the threshold at Ranville. So looking at some of the data here, so no post application versus four or eight leaf application. We had actually lower road track with the post application. Eight looked better compared to four leaf stage. Right, so again, we had the conditions favorable throughout the season. So I think that's why the eight leaf application looked better because you know it protected for three to four weeks more compared to the four leaf application in terms of uh, going to the harvest. 
60% of the routes had disease with no post compared to 25 or 15. The biggest difference you can see in yield, about seven tons with the post application. This is across both varieties and about 2,300 pounds across both varieties in terms of recoverable sucrose. But there was an interaction at this site between variety and then post. So what it tells you is the varieties respond differently depending on the post application here, all right? This is my 3.7 variety with a four leaf and an eight leaf application for the post. So they bought five uh, tons per acre bump with the post application. Looking at the 4.4 variety, we got about 10 ton response uh, at this site for this, right? That, that's pretty tremendous for me. Looking at some of the recoverable sucrose per acre numbers, again, for the resistant variety, no post, four leaf or eight leaf post, I see about 1,600 to 1,700 pounds recovery at this site, where the susceptible variety about 2,400 pounds or to 28, so about 6,000 pounds, no post, four and eight. So getting back to, so don't worry about soil temperatures. I think ideally, you know, you time your post application between four and eight, I would say any time between first week of June to third week. Uh, but the key is to get these post applications done. And number two, keep getting this question, do I need to wait for rain to time the post application? So my recommendation is go ahead and do your post application. If you get rain, that's great, but don't wait for rain to do your post application. Then you're gonna miss on entirely doing on that. So take home message for 2021, the varieties, I think we made a tremendous progress in terms of uh, building a higher yield and resistance for rhizoctonia. But sometimes you may not see the response unless you have a moderate to high disease pressure in the fields. So just, just pay attention to those fields. If you have really severe fields, the resistant variety will pay off. And seed treatments, excellent seed treatments since 2014. Again, the best protection you will get from them is about four to five weeks after planting. So, but don't rely on them completely until uh, end of the season. In for fungicides, like I said, you know, they offer protection from early to mid season, but they come with risk, especially if you have light soils or if the conditions are dry and then cooler during emergence. But if you have a severe field for rhizoctonia, the benefits are, uh, better than the rest for infro applications. And other key thing, especially if you're using a startup fertilizer, look for the compatibility and have a good agitation. I think you'll be better off. When it comes to post-emergence application, you know, 48 leaf, since you have the seed treatments offering protection, you don't need to worry about exact timings. So just go ahead and do between these. But there are certain years since 2014, I would say, two to three out of six, we did not see any response from the post fungicide application, just because the conditions are dry in August and then sometime in late July. So we didn't have enough disease pressure, then we didn't see response. But it doesn't mean that we had disease, but then there was no response from those fungicide applications. So again, in certain situations, the resistant variety can also respond just like we saw in 2020. So going forward, the best management practice for RISOC, seed treatment and a post, I would say this is for the moderate pressure. And if you have a severe field and you have lots of like soybeans and dry beans in the rotation, in a higher risk field, probably it's not a bad idea to do a seed treatment in for a, and a post application. I think, you know, everything that you can do. But the good news when we do this, uh, like I showed earlier, we have several different options for infra and post. If you don't want to rely on quadrage for both, you know, you could go with the uh, headline infra or uh, Xanthian and then go back with the quadrage uh, post application or go with quadrage infra or Excalia post application, right? So several different options. So it's better to rotate these fungicides, you know, uh, to minimize the risk for uh, building fungicide resistance. Although rhizoctonia, it has one life cycle, you know, it just uh, infects the roots at the end of the season, it uh, becomes dormant sclerotia. But, you know, over a long time, we don't know how quickly uh, the fungicide resistance will evolve for rhizoctonia. So 
rotating this uh, is a key too. With that, I would like to acknowledge the R&D board for funding this work and uh, several collaborators um, and the industry allies for supplying all the chemicals and seed. Uh, and uh, beyond everything, I think 2020, we know how tough it has been to get anything done. So I would like to thank my uh, team for getting everything done. I couldn't be thankful enough. And I'll be happy to take any questions now. And uh, here is a QR code. Please go ahead and scan you know, while we do the questions. Thanks. Ashok, is there a RISOC score um, where it doesn't pay to do a post application or infro anymore? Um, like a like a numerical number, 3.7, 3.6? That's a good question, Cody, but you know, 3.7, I consider the specialty variety, right? You know, that's the lowest score I could get from Crystal here. But we, if you look at the response from that in the Southern Maine, and you know, I was really surprised. Normally, you know, I would have expected maybe 500 to 1,000 pounds, uh, but still 1,600 pounds was uh, pretty significant. But this is where I think the risk for the field you know, with your uh, cropping history and the rotation, I think that that's a key factor for you to decide if you want to do a post or not. Because you might be thinking, I have a seed treatment and once the beets are six to eight leaf stage, you know, you get, get this natural resistance. But if the overwhelming disease pressure, you know, that may not be true in those cases. Thank you for being here again. And a very cold morning, it's minus 26 outside. Uh, it's usually good to be face-to-face, uh, -face, but when it's this cool here, um, it's also good to be in the comfort of your office or your home. So today I will discuss more or less some of the strategies to manage surcost per lease spot, and I'll spend a few minutes to talk about white mold, which has come suddenly and at very high incidence in some areas. So lease spot, <laughs> as you saw in the evaluations, the polls, we will share that at the end of today as well, continues to be our major problem in most production areas, especially in the, north, the southern end of the valley. At, at Mindac, based on your evaluation, about 56% of you have indicated that this is your biggest problem. And these are some pictures. The one on the left is from southern Minnesota, the one on the right from your area where you've had fungicides. And one of the big problem is fungicide resistance in that the fungus has been able to develop resistance to a number of the fungicides we use. And because of that, when you apply the fungicides in ideal conditions, the fungicides do not work as well as they were previous to the population becoming resistant. Another problem is the issue of rainfall. Uh, I will touch a little bit more on this um, as we go along, but please note in a wet year, especially in 2020, we had a very wet year in Mendak, where about, based on my calculation from Peter, about 25 of the 70 days that we used to spray had rain. So a lot of times the fungicides will be washed off. So leaf spot is still our biggest problem. So what can we do to manage this disease? Most of you have been doing, I believe all of you as growers have been using our recommendations. What are some of our recommendations? To use crop rotations. I don't think anybody be, uh, plans beat back to back. All of us or most of us use uh, some other crop before. Wheat is usually uh, the crop of choice if you can, if not corn. And if it's possible, try not to plant beets on soybean ground. And I'll come back to this a little bit more later. So crop rotation, most of you are doing this already. Our other recommendation, all of you do some form of tillage. It doesn't have to be deep plow. Anything that you can do to incorporate the infected leaves into the soil, even if it's about two inches, that will be good enough. You do not want the leaves on the top of the soil surface. If you can avoid that, then uh, that's the quickest way to reduce our inoculum load. Our inoculum load since 2016 has been very, very high. So in all of our production areas, 
uh, the disease can be very severe very quickly because of the high inoculum load. What else can you do? Uh, this is a picture of the MINDAC coded variety trial that is headed by Dr. Metzger and his team, phenomenal research site. You can see here, this is uh, more or less in September, uh, some green. And the green that you can see, the distinct green, these are varieties without any fungicides that are still very green. I'll show you some close up um, at the end of this growing season. The seed companies have done a phenomenal job of pr uh, providing varieties, breeding for varieties that are very resistant to sarcospora leaf spot. And for the Mindac area especially, you will have, I think over 50% of your um, acres will be planted to these new varieties. And what do I mean that they're looking good? These are some close up of some varieties. Some of them are approved. Uh, I think it's, there is a beta variety there. I think there is one from Crystal. Uh, those are approved. There is one from Cess that has not been approved, but it's still looking good. There is also another one from uh, Maribu that looks pretty good. So you can see in the trial, it was ver the disease were very, very severe, but these varieties without any fungicides were able to withstand the, the disease and still produce good yields. So we'll talk a little bit more about this here. How do we manage these very resistant varieties with fungicides? So resistant varieties when you can get them. And the other things that we're doing, everybody who use, who plant sugar beet use fungicides. Our recommendation, use fungicide mixtures. Nearly 90% of you, nearly 90% of you have indicated that you have mm. used mixtures. Some of you did not use mixtures and we can understand why. At Mindac, based on some of the survey I've had back, some of you have had six, some of you have, have had seven fungicide applications with mixtures. And some people call towards the end of the growing season in September and ask, can I just put on a shot of something else to prevent my field from getting even more brown? And I said, yes, if you want to go ahead and do that, go ahead and do that there. So use fungicide mixtures. Um, we're slowly getting better and better varieties. So you'll have to use less in another year or two. Uh, Dr. Metzger say water is cheap, it's free. So use at least 15 to 20 gallons of water and apply a 10 to 14 day intervals, especially for the more susceptible variety. Reduce your interval timing, especially when it's wet. As I said, in 2020, 25 of the 70 days that we apply fungicides, we had rainfall. So I'll show you what happens when you have that amount of rainfall in a year. So what I'll do, I'll show you some of the work we have done and I'll show you what happens in the year when we have high disease pressure, but we have enough dry days so you can spray, get the fungicides to work. And in those situations, the fungicides will provide very effective control. And I will also show you what happens in some years when you have so much rainfall that it doesn't matter if you put five, six, or seven fungicide application, if you have a susceptible variety, you will have problems. So this is a picture of the non-treated check at August 29th on the left-hand side, two weeks later, even the brown leaves are gone. You're having green leaves and you have regrowth, which will lead to high amino N and low sh sugar concentration. We have seen that the fungus has developed resistance to the QOIs, the Priaxor, the GEM, the Pyrac. And what that means is that when you apply the fungicides, initially it appears as if you're having a little bit of control but later in the season, the leaves will die. Your yield will probably be a slightly better than your non-treated check. And please note in these, most of the information I'll give you here with individual fungicides or fungicide mixtures is what we do as researchers to find out how effective these fungicides are by themselves. There are no rotations. This is the same fungicide applied three or four times back to back. So you can see here, this is early in the season. This is later in the season. 
So your leaves are dying, you will have low tonnage and very low sugar concentration. It doesn't matter which one of the, the, the QOIs or strobilurins you're using. For many years, the triazoles were also very, very effective. Um, tetraconazole or eminent was the fungicide that saved our, our industry. Then we had Inspire, which was working very well. Uh, 2016 is the first year when we had full scale resistance building to the QOIs and we had gradual reduction in efficacy of the triazole. You can see the Minerva was working a little bit better than the Inspire. The Flutriafol was not working well at all in 2016. Uh, if you look at just at the leaf spot rating, you can see Priaxo was not very much different from the check, but as I indicated, it does give you some control orally and then everything goes uh, brown. The triazoles, which were just as effective as Priaxo or Headline in the good old days prior to 2016, Eminent, Minerva, Inspire, and Proline, when it's wet, when you have a high population of a resistant a Sarcospora, they don't do well either. You have a high leaf spot rating and the recoverable sucrose, although higher than the check, are not as good as you will like for the potential of that particular variety. I show you a picture here of 2017, and then I'll show you a picture of 2019. In 2017, you can see here Eminent four times on the left. On the left, this is Inspire four times. On the right is Proline. What we have seen over the years is that this particular fungicide Proline appears to be the best in terms of leaf spot control of all the triazoles that we have. This is 2017, it was wet. 2019 was not as wet. We had higher yields overall, but the only problem we couldn't harvest in some areas. So you can see Minerva, Inspire, Proline and Minerva do, they all perform fairly well because the population was lower and it was not as wet. When we look at the yield, you can see that in the one in the brown is the dry year. In the wet, it's the in the blue, it's the wet year. You can see the non-treated check was very close to 10 in both instances. But proline in dry conditions, inspire and Minerva, their leaf spot rating were below six. And usually, once it's below six for us, it's usually not very economically damaging. In the wetter year 2017, the disease ratings were higher and recoverable sucrose, you can't really see it on my screen here, was also lower. What has been saving us is the old fungicide, TIN. It affects the respiration ATP. And although it affects that, we still consider it more or less as a multi-site. It affects more than one site rather than the site-specific triazole and the strobilurin. So tin is one of our best fungicides, and I will stress this more and more in our applications and our recommendations. We are always stressing, always have a tin and always have a triazole. Always have a tin, always have a triazole. Consider those as your base. Then always add something to your tin and something else to your triazole, another mode of action. And if you use that in a rotation program, for the most part, you will have good control if the conditions are favorable. I will come to the, uh, to the mixing, mixing partners shortly. So tin over the years has been uh, pretty good by itself, but we don't recommend using it by itself. Proline to the left, you can see, looks pretty good all in the season, but later in the season, it starts to get brown. If you mix it with tin, it looks better later in the season. This looks pretty good, but when we do this, especially if you're in Mendak or even in Southern Minnesota, you're using your two best fungicides. If you're only using one application, this will be ideal, this will be great. You'll have excellent control, but you are using four, five, six, and seven applications, and we cannot use out all of our ACEs. We have to split this up. So we'll see how to, to split the triazoles up and the tin up as well. You can see here again, it's not only Proline, but Inspire and tin looks better than Inspire alone. And that's the full rate. Minerva by itself, not so good. Minerva and tin, much, much better. 
And one can always argue that tin by itself is very good, yes. So here again, we are showing that if you use a DMI and you use tin with it, and this will be more or less ideal for people in the northern areas. Let's say you are in the Grafton and the Grand Forks area. You use proline is good, but we always recommend something else. So you add tin to it, it looks very good. But as I said, those are our aces. What else can we use? We have the multi-sites, the others. They are not so good by themselves, like the Mancozeb, the EBDZs, either in the form of manzate or ditane. You have the coppers. I just use badge. Um, we have used other trials where we've used about 10 or 11 different copper products. And for the most part, for the most part, all of the co copper products are working fairly well. So here again, leaf spot rating below six and a high recoverable sucrose per acre. The EBDCs by themselves, copper by itself, or if you use a copper and an EBDC, you're also having good leaf spot control and acceptable recoverable sucrose per acre. So this is what I'm kind of talking about when, we, when I'm saying let's use other modes of action to improve the efficacy of our ACEs. Our ACEs are tin and the triazoles. You can see if you use, uh, this is Manzate and Inspire, looks very well. Uh, Badge and Inspire also look very well. Now these, the Badge and the Inspire, they're not only a multi-site and a site specific, but what else is happening here? This was a year when you did not have too much rainfall. So the fungicide is getting an opportunity to perform, to provide effective control. What happens if you have a rainfall? The badge is more or less a protectant. Inspire is also considered as a protectant, but it is systemic. The triazoles and topsin, they are systemic. So it's always good wherever possible to have a systemic, a triazole in so that if you get a rainfall and it washes off your badge or your EBDC, you will still get some control from your systemic fungicides. Here I'm showing you two multi-sites, a copper and an EBDC. You also have another protectant in the form of tin and topsin. Topsin by itself is not very good, but we have seen over the years, it's cheap, it is systemic, so if you put it with tin and you don't have too much of a rainfall, you will get your bang for your buck in having better disease control. The triazoles, you can use it with either copper or an EBDC. Copper or EBDC. Uh, some places prefer to use the EBDCs more. Uh, I have seen both of them work very well. Some years you might have this past year, I think the EBDCs worked a little bit better than the copper. The copper probably washed off a little bit more, but it was not very easy to differentiate between the copper and the manzate. Was it effective to use mixtures in 2019? Here again, you have your non-treated check. You have the amount of re uh, returns you will get. You can see that once you use mixtures, and I put different colors to show different modes of action, a triazole, which is systemic, plus an EBDC, a protectant, a super tin, which is a multi-site with a site-specific, a site-specific with another EBDC, followed by tin and an EBDC. If you do these mixtures here, you have excellent disease control and high recoverable sucrose per acre. In 2019, I said it was not very wet. So if I started this application here at row closure, at row closure, which is a little bit earlier than at uh, what I call disease onset, which is a, about maybe two weeks later, you had a little bit less recoverable sucrose per acre. It was not statistical, but there was a trend uh, for the earlier application to do better than the later application. If it's a dry year, as 2019 was relative to 2020, uh, you don't see much difference in disease control and recoverable sucrose. But if it's in a wet year, that 
earlier application is very, very critical, especially if you have a susceptible variety. So you can use, especially in the MINDAC area, this is what I will recommend different modes of action. Towards the end of the growing season, you can also use, if you wish, some tin and either a copper or a tin and EBDC. So it was effective to use fungicide mixtures in a rotation and you can see different years. I, I give you different uh, pictures here. This one here looks pretty good. You can play around with different combinations. You have effective control. These are the years when you don't have too much rainfall. What do I mean by that? You have enough rainfall to make a good crop to get high tonnage, but it's not happening soon after your fungicide application. These rainfalls are not happening soon after your rainfall application, after your fungicide application. If that happens, then you have poor uh, fungicide efficacy, poor disease control. This is 2018 and 2019. Uh, the previous ones were more or less mixtures of different modes of action. Here I use different multi-sites, tin and an EBDC, tin and copper, uh, or just a copper and an EBDC. Once you do mixtures again and you apply it in a timely manner, you don't get too much rainfall, you can control the disease using those fungicide mixtures as well. In 2020, based on our reports of um, rainfall at Campbell, Wapiton, Breckenridge, and at our own sites, starting from around uh, July, August, and the fifth through the 15th of September, we had 25 days when we had rainfall. 25 of those 75 days when you had rainfall. So one in every three days. So the site here at Fox Home looks very good. But every time after we finish applying the fungicide, we had to go in with a tillage equipment, a cultivator, to uh, tidy up the site or else you will not be able to put on your next application. So very uh, early in the season, you didn't have too much disease in July. There was very little disease, but in, in August, the disease um, became very severe. And just early in September, you can see a uh, picture on the left. You can see a few more plots here with green. This is Menda coated variety trial here again. You come back about two weeks later on, you, you're only seeing a few of these varieties now are green. Most of them are brown. These are the resistant ones. And likewise, at our research site, only a few of the areas are green, and those are more or less resistant varieties, not so much the fungicidal effect. I will discuss this picture here a little bit more. Uh, at the back here, we have your varieties that are supposed to be much more resistant to sarcosper leaf spot, what they call the generation two of sarcosper leaf spot resistant varieties. Most of the seed companies were trying to ramp up their seed production so that you can get commercial seeds. So as such, we're willing to get one variety. And you can see here, this little trial that we did right here, you had between zero and five fungicide application. And it only, this only goes from here to the green. I could not see any difference between zero application and five or six fungicide applications. Visually, if you did not put some fungicides, you could see they looked a little bit more yellow, a little bit not so healthy. But where you put the fungicides, uh, it, they weren't really that critical. They performed, everything performed well here, the variety. Right next to it, I'll show you some close up. You can see a lot of brown and some greens. And the greens again here are varieties with more tolerance to the disease. If you come to this particular site here, most of these here are looking brown, and some of these here had five or six fungicide applications. It did not matter how many applications you put. This variety here, and a lot of the other areas I'll show you later, the least spot rating of this variety was five. And anything five or above, because of the amount of rainfall we had, no matter how many fungicide applications we put on, we are not able to control the disease after, let's say, September the 2nd. Okay, I want you to just memorize your answer here for me. 
So we have variety A, variety B, variety C, and variety D. Just look at the four middle rows. One, two, three, four. The other rows on the left and the right are guess rows. So keep your answer in. Which one do you think looks the best? A variety A, a variety B, a variety C, or a variety D? The answer is variety D. I hope you agree with me. Now, my next question to you is, which one of these do you think had the most fungicide application? Out of variety A, B, C, and D, which one had the most fungicide application? And this is a trick question. Look at the title, effect of host resistance on sarcospor leaf spot. If you said D, you are not correct. All four of these varieties had the same number of fungicide application, four or five fungicide applications in mixtures. The reason why D looks better than the others, or D looks better than A, B looks better than uh, C as well, is because of the ability of the variety to tolerate the fungus. So you can see right in this picture here that different varieties based on their inheritance of the genes for resistance, and it's usually four or five genes that come to work together. You apply the same fungicide, but this variety D had the lowest CLS rating and had the best response in terms of the least severity. We'll talk a little bit more about that. The picture on your left-hand side, range one, two, three, and four. This was September 2nd in the trial that we had sequenced. You can still see some green. A few weeks later on, these same varieties, all the leaves were gone and they were brown. It didn't matter which treatment you were using because the disease severity was so high and the amount of rainfall you had were washing off all the fungicide. As I said, none of you will use this kind of rating here of five, uh, but it just shows you that if you have a very high leaf spot rating and you have lots of rainfall, it becomes more or less impossible for you to control the disease. So some of you may be asking, am I doing something wrong in my field? No, most of you are doing the right thing. You are using the, the varieties that were available to you. You are using fungicide as a mixture. Most of you are using high water volume. But if there's too much of rain, it washes off the fungicide. And there is where we will need better varieties. I'll show you a few slides here where we had the Foxum trial in 2020. It was very wet. As I said, 25 of the 70 days we had to apply fungicide, we had rainfall. The least spot rating of the check was 10. The sugar concentration was 12.8. And the highest tonnage of any of these treatments was 17 tons. You can see the best treatment where we started at row closure. I think we had about six fungicide application in mixture. The leaf spot rating, and this was early in September, by the end of the season, it went down. We took this rating when the check was 10. The sugar was very good, 17.8%, but you only had just over 4,000 pounds of recoverable sugar, 5,000 pounds. The other next treatment was tin and manzate, followed by Inspire and manzate, tin and badge, proline and manzate, super tin and manzate. So you can have fairly good control early in the season, but everything goes down later in the season. Another treatment, you have other fungicides that you can use in mixtures. The problem is the leaf spot rating, this is early in the season when this one was already 10, but by the end of the season, everything was close to nine or 10. The, the average tons for the, or the highest tons for any of the treatment was 17 tons per acre. Now, the one picture I showed you earlier was where we had one variety and we had a check or we had treatments. Some of these here had, I think it was one, two, three, four, five, six applications. This one here had five applications. Another one had two applications. Another one, three applications another one, two applications. Look at the C CLS rating. 
it didn't matter if you had no application or six applications. The ratings vary from one to 1 1.5 because of the inherent ability of the fungus to withstand, of the, of the variety to withstand the fungus. Look at your yields. Now, let me say that Fox home in 2020 was not very ideal for sugar beet production or any other crop. There was too much rainfall, too much standing water. However, these varieties were able to get anywhere between 26 and 28 tons, which was more or less a reflection of what happened at Mindak last year. The average was about 24 tons. This particular area along Highway 19 was very, very wet. So 24 tons was the average with 16.8% sugar. For the most part, this variety was over 17% sugar with or without fungicide. So we're still learning how to use these newer varieties. We're hoping that in 2021, we'll get more improved varieties so we can do more testing to determine uh, when will be the best time to apply fungicides. We will discuss this a little bit more later. This picture here shows us, just look at the forest range. What I was trying to do was to use these two varieties here. This is a commercial variety, one, two, three, four, five, six treatments. Five of these, the first five have fungicides, about five to six application. The one with the X is the untreated check. The least spot rating for there is about 4.8. This other variety was about 4.4 five different fungicide applications and a check, another more tolerant variety, around four or less, five treatments with fungicides and a check, and the one to the extreme right, five treatments and a check. And you can see over time that the two commercial varieties, these here, although we are putting on five and six and seven fungicide applications, by the time you were ready to harvest, all of these here became brown. The more tolerant, and this was an experimental variety uh, that kind of, they stayed green and their yields were high. I'll just give you some figures. These are uh, four varieties. Unfortunately here, I can't see the fourth one D. I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but what's happening, the two commercial varieties, because of the fact that their leaf spot rating uh, was 4.8 or 4.3, even with fungicides. The fungicides were not really getting to control the disease because of too much rainfall. Variety C and variety D, let me go back to this one here. They were performing much better, not so much because of the fungicides, because the fungicides were being washed off of everything, but just because of the ability of the variety to withstand the fungus. Uh, if you, I don't know if you can see variety D here, but most of the, the yield here are about 9,000 pounds, including the non-treated check. So my take home message for lease spot is use a holistic system. You are all doing the right thing. You're doing crop rotation. You're incorporating your infected debris. We know that the QOIs are not working as well as they used to. So try to avoid them where possible. There will come a time when we're hoping that they will be useful again, and that will kind of segue into my next topic. Tin and triazoles are your aces. Those are your best fungicides. You protect them. How do you do that? By mixing, either with an EBDC or a copper or a topsin. Dr. Metzger says water is free, water is cheap. Use 15 to 20 gallons of water per acre. Uh, right now, the recommendation is about 80 PSI, but we have seen some instances where 60 to 70 PSI works well. Once you use the water volume, you should be in good stead. <clears throat> if you have varieties that are more than 4.0 in CLS rating, you must start your application at about row closure. To get your best disease control, we don't know what the season is going to bring. What we know is if it rains, it will be difficult to control the disease. What we know is we have lots of sarcospora in our, in our fields. So we need to make sure that we control it. In dry conditions, about 14 days interval will work. 
when it's wet, you'll probably have to go to 10 days. And if you have a rainfall, if you have a heavy rainfall within 48 hours of applying your fungicides, you may, you may have to go back and make another application again. If you have more resistant varieties, according to Dr. Metzger, you're having some this year. Some of them are very resistant, 1.8 to 1.2. You will probably need, need less fungicides. But here again, you'll probably need to maybe put one early in the season, one mid-season, and one probably late in the season. We'll have to do much more work before we give you a form recommendation. Uh, we've put in for some money. Hopefully, we'll get some, uh, some funding. And I'm hoping to get more varieties from more companies that are resistant so we can kind of compare them all at the same time. So that's for leaf spot. Uh, if we didn't have this one particular problem, you will say, okay, we can probably relax a little bit. But what we have seen first in 2019 in the Mindak area, but at very, very low incidence was white mold. Yes, white mold, which is common in edible beans and canola and sunflower. Uh, we found it first in Fairmont, but we thought it was just a one-time deal. But in 2020, we saw it in Manomen area. Uh, we saw it in Ada at our resource site in Prosper. At Fox, we saw it. And Dr. at Southern Minnesota, Mr. Bloomquist called and said, we have some issues here. This is what it looks like early in the season. At the lowest leaves closest to the ground, they are the ones to start getting uh, the disease. They will start becoming yellow, brown, and then they die. Uh, some varieties are green. It doesn't matter. They may look a little bit greener from far, but when you go and you look at the lowermost leaves, they are on the ground, they're dying. If you have a more yellow variety, it's a little bit more distinct. The leaves are dying, they fall to the ground, and they die. Uh, this is what it looks like late in uh, September and October. One thing that appears to be a little distinguishing when you go and you look at some of the leaves, and, and these pictures here, some of these, these uh, pictures were taken in fields that had about five fungicide application for leaf spot. So you may see some leaf spots, but most of these here, the fungus is dead, the sarcospor is dead. You may see a distinguishing blackening along the midrib and the petiole that leads down towards the root. So we checked the roots, but the roots didn't have any discoloration within and the outside looked very healthy. The outside looked very healthy, so we didn't see any disruption to the roots. We took infected leaves, grew them on a medium, and then infect the sugar beet leaves. And of course, this is what we kind of found. It was very damaging. The fungus will move all along this midrib, down to the crown and kill the plants. And the fungus doesn't only affect sugar beet, it affects sunflower, it affects soybean, it affects pinto beans. So all of these crops here, if you grow them in rotation, one of the best thing we can do short term is not to plant a soybean before sugar beet or do not plant a sugar beet if you can on a soybean field or a pinto bean field, especially after a year like 2020 and 2019 when it was very wet, 2018 was also very wet. Now, uh, we've asked for some funding to do some research, but in the meanwhile, we went to the, into the lab and tried some fungicides to see which can help us to control the disease. An initial research shows that Prioxor, which is an SDHI, looks very, very good potentially. Uh, Proline looks good. Vortisan, we use it as a C treatment. Propulse also look relatively good compared to the control. My one disappointment, I was hoping that Topsin will work, but this Topsin is not very much different from my control. So Prioxor looks pretty good. This is labeled. Endura is another product from BASF, but it's not labeled, that's Boscolid. What else looks good? Uh, most of the triazoles, be it Eminent, Proline, Inspire, they all look good compared to the control. And what we saw was that Diphenconazole, which is uh, present in um, Inspire XT, it looks good by itself. And if you put two of these fungicides together, they look even better. This is Proline and Inspire. This is Inspire and Eminent. So I'm hoping that the fungicides that we apply for leaf spot control will help to control uh, white mold. The only problem is I believe the white mold may start earlier in the season when it's cooler. So we still have to figure that out. When will be the best time to control it? 
if this becomes a problem. Uh, one question I had, I couldn't answer because what happened, this disease, when it comes into your field, it's not like rhizoctonia where it's patchy. It infects 100% of the plant. Here we have four different, different varieties, variety A, variety B, variety C, and variety D. I was asked a question and I said, I will defer to you because you have been growing beets much longer than I have been around. And uh, you know what a field looks like when you're losing yield. Based on these pictures here, this disease, it starts around uh, what I've seen the past couple of years around August, and it gets worse and worse over time. This was in October. I will give you a poll a little bit later. Do you think based on these pictures that white mold is causing a reduction in yield and it may impact quality. I saw some pictures from Dr. Metzger when he gave a presentation at USDA where he showed sarcospora leaf spot, uh, severe leaves, reducing tonnage and reducing quality. I think some of these pictures will be kind of close to it, not as severe because here some of the leaves are still green and his own all the leaves were brown. But remember what I've always said in the past, the oldest leaves are the most productive leaves. And which leaves are being killed here? Our lowest most leaves first. My summary for white mold is that the best things you can do for prevention of this, this, this disease is to try to plant sugar beet on some other crop other than a host of white mold. Do not plant it on soybean or edible beans. If you can plant it on, on wheat will be ideal or barley. I know a lot of you are trying to do that. Uh, if you have to plant it on corn, that's another option, but not the beans. If it were a dry year and you didn't have much white mold, then it would probably be okay, but it's a risk that um, not worth the chance taking. And the white mold can stay in the field for a long time, for many years. We're hoping to evaluate a number of fungicides and hopefully uh, these will help to control the disease. With that, I would like to say thank you uh, these are your CUs. You can take a, you will need to take two pictures. This is one of them. If you have your phone, you can scan it. We'll show it back at the end of the uh, meeting as well, as well as the next one. This one here is for 0.5 uh, CUs, and then the other one will give you the remaining CUs. With that, I would like to acknowledge you for being here today. I would like to acknowledge the growers for your funding, not only for research, but for educational program. Thank you. Thank you to all the people who have made our research possible, the seed companies, the chemical companies. Uh, some of you have good products. Some of you have experimental products that you're trying to make things work better for us. Thank you. We'll continue to try to make them work for you. Uh, Luke Skansgaard from uh, KWS for taking out a lot of the pictures aerially. Bruce Sundin as well. Kevin for allowing us to use his farm. American Crystal Grand Forks Lab for doing a phenomenal job for all our, uh, um, all our trials. My colleagues at NDSU, they do all the hard work for harvesting. And the person who makes the work looks really good is Peter, uh, his students and his group of interns. My email address and my telephone numbers are present. If you do see, if you do see any disease that you have not seen in the past, especially white mold, and even if you see some alternaria, which is different from sarcospora, please call your agriculturist and give me a call as well. I would like to check it out and know how severe this issue is. With that, I will take any questions. Are there any questions? Anything in the chat box, if you want, you can also put stuff in the chat box. That's my 40 minutes, I think there, Tom. Well, I'll, I'll read the questions in the chat for you, Muhammad. The first question from Luke is, if I use Preaxer at row closure for rhizoctonia, will it affect resistant levels of QOIs? If you use, uh, so you're using Preaxer at row closure for rhizoctonia. Uh, we don't know for sure. That's a loaded question. Uh, because of the fact that the fungal pathogen that we have, if you look at Dr. Secor's um, analysis, 
over 90% of them are, are already resistant to the QOIs. So I don't think it's already a, a bad case situation. It's already not working very well for lease spot control. So if you want to use it for rise up control, uh, I will say go ahead and use it. I'll probably go a little bit earlier than rule closure though, because typically at rule closure, especially in the Mendak area, I've gone with John Dummer, July, just after July 4th, and you already had dead or dying plants with rhizoctonia. So you may want to go a little bit earlier. Other question, other comments? There's an another question, uh, two more questions. Glenn is asking about chlorothalonol and its activity on, on Sacospora. I am sorry, I had a picture. I don't know if I still have it here. I think I took it out. But chlorothalonil was the only other fungicide that we saw that had effective control when used in a mixture. Uh, so we, we did some work several years ago, and right now we have enough data. It would be good to have another year or two data to show that chlorothalonil can be used in a mixture with tin or a triazole, and it will probably be comparable to an EBDC or a copper, maybe a little bit better. But we still have to get EPA to give us clearance on that. There was one more question, Tom? Yes, from Brian. Brian's asking about field bordering. And he wants to know uh, about using the more resistant varieties on the borders to improve control for the whole field. That might be a strategy. I know at Mindac, uh, one thing that Dr. Metzger has recommended is kind of spraying the edge of, or the borders of the field so you prevent the inoculum from moving in. That might be a strategy. We have not tried that. It's kind of difficult for us to do it on our small plots but it may be a way to go, which will be similar to spraying the, uh, the border of your fields early to prevent uh, the inoculum from moving in from, uh, from outside more or less. Um, a lot of you had really nice green fields in August and September. Uh, I took some pictures of some fields around, along Highway 210 that looked spectacular in August and early September. But by the end of September and October, just before harvest, those fields became brown, not because of anything you did. You didn't do anything wrong. It was just, there was just too much rain that was washing off the fungicides. And the level of resistance we have in those varieties is only so much that it can do to withstand that population. So overall, when you look at your sugar concentration, which was just under 17, it was not too bad compared to how some of the field looked. And that was not your fault. Mohammed. So, yes, sir. I, I have one question. Probably it's useful for everybody here. Uh, looking at these white mold fields, is there anything that's common among these fields? Um, all we know was that for based on my conversation with the growers uh, that we had, especially in Ada and Prosper, Either a year before, a lot of them were a year before, they either had soybeans or edible beans. Okay. At Prosper, we had soybeans. At Ada, Tom and um, Amitava were there. And the grower had about three different varieties. And Tom and Amitava had two different varieties. They all had a disease. And right. the grower, what the grower said, okay, he came, he visited us, and he said, he will make sure that he doesn't put edible beans. He doesn't do much soybeans, but he won't put edible beans before his sugar beet. So my recommendation for the short term is at least try to avoid that bean crop before sugar beet if you can. Thank you. I would like to visit with you. Um, I want to talk about weed control and sugar beet. And I will tell you in advance, there's going to be a very, very strong water hemp overture to my presentation. So um, I know from the survey, there's other weeds. We'll have to talk about those offline because today I'm gonna talk almost exclusively about water hemp. So I'm gonna start with my recommendations and I want you to really focus on the top line. So in previous years, what we've talked about is, tell me when you're gonna plant sugar beets. If you're going to plant before April 20th, 
In some cases, we didn't always use a pre-emergence. In 2021, we would like for you to use a pre-emergence regardless of when you plant. And I'll get into what some of the thinking is about that um, as we develop the presentation. And then follow the program you've used in, in, in previous years. Go into the chloroacetamide program for lay-by. And then we're going to talk about some ideas that we have for control of escape water hemp if there are escapes in your field. So there's a couple of times during this talk where I'm going to tell you that I'm wrong. And here's an example of, an, of that. So in previous years, previous presentations, I've indicated to you that water hemp germinates and emerges after the 15th of May. Well, look at the picture on the left. This is from Greg Kraus. He's over in a field in the Mapleton area. And Greg has water hemp. Those cotyledons are absolutely water hemp cotyledons. And it's the 2nd of May. So what's going on? Well, I think part of the story really dates back to the previous fall. Um, I, I've talked before that water hemp germinates and emerges through the month of July, maybe into early August. Well, because of all the rain we had, we had some late germinating water hemp in August, maybe even early September 2019. And those water hemp all made seed, okay? They may not have made very much seed, but they indeed made seed. And Greg, thanks for cleaning your hands before you took that picture. Now, it wasn't just Mapleton where we saw water hemp. We saw early germinating phenotypes in a lot of places. And again, um, we're attributing some of this to maybe the fall we had, but the other thing that Joe Eichley pointed out to me is that seed by and large went to the soil surface and we had some pretty warm days in early April that may have triggered germination and emergence. So I, I did an experiment uh, along with uh, David Mettler um, and we looked at pre-treatments. And in this particular experiment, we had four treatments. We had the control. Um, we had at the fumizate at four pints, at the fumizate at two pints, and then dual magnum at 12 ounces. We didn't have the combination of ethyl and dual, but I'll talk a little bit about that afterwards. So what we saw, first of all, starting at Hickson, is improved control with at the fumizate at four pints compared to etho at two pints or dual magnum, and certainly much better um, control than the pre-treatment. But at Lake Lillian, we didn't see any differences across treatments. There's no statistical differences here. And interestingly, even the pre looked good. So um, when we went down and evaluated the pre's, we had very, very little weed pressure in, in this particular experiment. And by and large, what we evaluated was ground cover. What percent of the ground cover in the plot was free of water hemp? And that, I think, attributes to high numbers. Now, Lake Lillian was very different, or, or Bloomcast was very different from our site at Hickson. Um, it was very dry after planting or during planting. And we believe that attributed to some of the results that we observed. So here's a, a picture from the experiment. Um, this is late May and we've already got a carpet of weeds at Hickson. So I would say in my experiences with water hemp, it's very unusual to have this much pressure um, this early in the season. And, and contrast that to the ethofumazate treatment on the right.
Okay. So I, I want to talk a little bit more about ethofumazate. Um, we saw more ethofumazate application at higher rates in 2020 than in previous years. So we did this experiment both at Moorhead and Bloomquist. We're going to talk to this morning about the experiment at, at Bloomquist. So the different lines represent rates. So we started at one and a half pints. Um, that's on the bottom. The line on top in green is seven and a half pints. And what the dots on the map represent control over time. So there's, there's a couple of points that I want to make here. And I want to use this line at 85%. Um, it didn't matter what rate of ethofumazate you used, we didn't stay above that line. Even seven and a half pints didn't give us more than 57 days of control. The second thing is, is these low rates, one and three pints, we didn't get anywhere close to 85% control with those treatments. And one of the other things that I've been saying is the, the advantage of the low rate early on pre is to buy us some time. So I'm questioning if my logic is right there. Are we getting full rate? Are we getting full control for maybe 20 or 30 days until we start the lay-by program? Or are we getting less than full control? And I want to go back and say that we had a heck of a time of getting this product activated. And we believe that probably explains some of the differences. But we're going to study this in more detail in, in 2021. So which of the pre-treatments should we use? And I'm going to compare and contrast dual magnum pre using our 24C local needs label. And I'm gonna contrast that with ethofumazate. So one thing I'm gonna say about Etho is there's a lot of flexibility in price depending on where you live. So please shop around because you're gonna see a lot of different prices. With Etho, we need more rain. I've been talking a little bit about that already. We need three quarters of an inch to get it activated. And contrast that with dual magnum Dual takes a lot less rainfall to get activated. Um, we need to use the local needs label. We need an indemnified label. The other advantage of, of dual magnum is, is it's a little cheaper. But the treatment that we really like, if we had to pick one treatment, the one that we like the best is the combination of dual at half a pint plus etho at two pints. I think we get the best of both worlds with that treatment. The early, um, e the early activation from the dual, but the longer length of control from ethyl. I wanna go back to the first slide I had. I mentioned that we're interested in a pre-treatment, regardless of when you plant. And our data supported this. The green bars indicate um, um, good control. This is control over 85%. And it's not surprising to me that the biggest bars are, are programs that involve the pre-treatment, pre starting with pre's. How about lay-by? So we have a lot of options here. Um, we have warrant, we have dual magnum, um, we have outlook, there's some generics. Which products should you use? And I will tell you in my work, they've all looked good. And really the decision is up to you. What's important to you? If you're concerned about replanting, I would use dual because I don't think you have to wait. You could replant right into dual magnum residues and be fine. What about activation? Well, the one that requires the most rain is warrant, the one the least amount of rain is Outlook. So if getting it activated is important to you, use Outlook. Sugar beet safety, I think maybe 
at least in some conditions, dual magnum and warrant are safer than, than Outlook. Length of control, warrant, spectrum. Um, warrant gets us some lambs quarters. And then after that, you decide, whoever you work best um, in industry. <clears throat> We've talked a lot about mixtures. And sometimes, especially at lay-by time, the um, chloroacetamide herbicide is going out with, with, with power max. Maybe you put some ethafumazate in there. And in other cases, there's been other admixtures to the combination. So we've, we've seen um, insecticide in the mix. We've seen stigger. We've even seen beta mix in, in, the, in the mixture. But one of the things that I observed, and this was through the help of one of the agriculturalists, is occasionally we see some injury in sugar beets. So my team and I have spent a lot of time, both in the field and in the greenhouse, trying to identify and to better understand crop safety, especially with these complex mixtures. So this is a result of a greenhouse study. And I will tell you, these are very, very high rates. We wouldn't typically use 21 ounces of Outlook. Um, also, there's a six ounce rate of Stinger here. But what we saw is as the mixture got more complex, as there were more products in the tank together, we saw more sugar beet injury. Now, one thing that's important, that injury it, it, it becomes less over time. So from 14 days, from seven to 14 days, you can see the change in visual injury. And then when we harvested the pots, we didn't see any significant differences. So that phenotype we see is very early. It's right after application and sugar beets have a tremendous ability to, to recover from that phenotype. I wanna talk about the survey a little bit. These are results from the meeting one year ago. And it, it's, the question is, it relates to the chloroacetamide program. How effective was that program? And these are responses from the Wilmer, Wapaton and Fargo meeting. And you can see that 80% of the time, growers had good to excellent control. So that's great, I'm happy for those guys. But what I wanna do is talk about the fair and poor control. And I wanna present during the next 10 minutes or so, some options for controlling escape water hemp and sugar beets. So the first question is, is how many water hemp are too many? And, you know, some might say, well, you know, these aren't that bad. There's, uh, there's water hemp out there, but I can live with that. I want to present some data from two, two gentlemen that I have a lot of respect for. So the first is Dr. Um, Schweitzer from USDA in Colorado. And what Dr. Schweitzer said or found is even six weeds per 100 feet a row. So I'm looking at the graph on the right, six weeds per 100 feet of row gave a 10% yield loss. 24 weeds, so a weed every five feet apart, four feet apart or so, that was close to 30% loss in biomass. And it was worse with kochia. Um, there was, Similarity in terms of the reduction with lamb's quarter and redroot pigweed, but kochia was absolutely the worst. Dr. Dexter did some similar work, um, um, Alan, along with his grad student, Rick Evans. And in many respects, they found the same thing. So at, at very low densities, this time weeds that are about seven feet apart, they had about a 15% loss in yield. Um, red red pigweed that was about five inches apart, almost a 50% um, loss in yield. 
But one piece of information from Rick's experiment that I think is really, really important, and it relates to when you plant. And it contrasts an experiment that they did back in 1978. And it, it indicates the loss in yield, and it's compared to when sugar beet were planted. So there's about a 14 day difference here, two week difference between essentially no loss in yield and a 40 to 45% um, percent yield loss. So that early season sugar beet growth and development is extremely important. So um, I, wanna, I wanna tell you something about water hemp. Water hemp is, is easiest to control when it's small. And I don't care what program you're using. And unfortunately, small water hemp turn into big water hemp. So I, I want to encourage you to get out and scout. And, and I want you to be in the fields early. And I want you to respond when water hemp is at the cotyledon stage or two leaf stage. Don't wait. Don't wait at all. So the first strategy might be to use Roundup. Um, the response to water hemp from Roundup is not binary. Um, we see some um, control, especially against small water hemp with full rates. Now, once the water hemp gets bigger, we don't see such good control anymore. But even with Roundup, even with resistance biotypes, at least some resistant alleles, we see some control. And then two, three, four, um, we're gonna talk about cultivation for a few minutes, the weed zapper, um, herbicides applied through the hooded sprayer, and finally ultra blazer uh, applied post-emergence in sugar beets. <clears throat> so we've talked a lot about mixing stinger together with Roundup. And you've heard me say over and over that Stinger controls four families of weeds, but one of those families is not pigweed. So one of the, uh, again, an observation from an agriculturalist, Peters, you know, it kind of looks like we're seeing some efficacy from Roundup and Stinger together. So we tried it in the greenhouse. So what these bars represent is the difference in control from Stinger, PowerMax, and Etho compared to PowerMax and Etho by itself. So what you're seeing, and you can see it in the pictures as well, on very, very small water hemp, the Stinger is helping us out a little bit. We're getting about a 20, maybe even a 25% bump from having Stinger in the tank. Now, when the weeds got bigger and it didn't take very long, just a matter of days, that, that benefit was less. And um, by the time they were two to four leaves, there was no benefit at all. So one strategy that you might consider is adding a little stinger into that mixture. Next advantage is to cultivate. So I'm gonna play off the comments from Dr. Chanda early on. If you're gonna consider using the cultivator, be concerned about Rhizoctonia crown rot, and you might wanna consider using um, Quadris in that particular program because we have seen some evidence of Rhizoc before. Does cultivation control escape weeds? Absolutely it does. Um, and we've seen anywhere from 60 to 70 to 80% control in our research. What about that barrier? Will cultivation disrupt the barrier that we have with soil applied herbicides? That's what this slide is about. So it considers three locations, um, two different timings, 14 and 28 days. And, and we were looking at late germinating water hemp only in this experiment. And what we saw, and, and you can see the difference in bars, um, blue bars are with cultivation, um, red bars are no cultivation, the axis is percent water hemp control. We didn't see any differences at all. 
And at least in one field, we saw an advantage to cultivating. So there's no penalty for, for running the cultivator, even if you're using the lay-by program. Let's talk about the weed zapper for a minute. So lots of experience with the Lasco system from the 1980s. There's a new kit on the block, it's called the weed zapper, and it brings three advantages compared to the old equipment. So the first is the booms on the front. The second, there's a lot more killing power, a lot more wattage with this system. And then the third is the safety improvements are tremendously improved from the original system. So what we see is an immediate phenotype when we run the weed zapper in field. It's a wilting phenotype. We see that immediately and it doesn't change at all statistically over time, up to 14 days. So about three days later, we see necrosis. And that necrosis that's in the stem and in the branch leaves of water hemp grows as we go from three to seven to 14 days. So you can see a statistical improvement in necrosis at each evaluation timing. And that, that necrosis corresponds to overall control. So against water hemp, we saw pretty good control. We saw 85% control um, using the, the weed zapper. But here's the thing. We already saw weed interference because you can't go out with a zapper until water hemp is over the canopy. So you've already taken some loss in yield before you can even use the equipment. Next idea is the hooded sprayer. So this is an idea from cotton producers. Um, cotton um, is very um, herbicide intensive, um, weed control intensive, and they're using a hooded sprayer that's built in by Wilmer Fabrication in cotton production. So we thought, what if we did the same thing? What if we use the hooded sprayer in sugar beets and we would select two herbicides, Liberty and Gramoxone, that had um, a lot of the regulatory work done already for sugar beets. So what we did is we did two kinds of experiments, uh, weed control experiments and efficacy experiments. Um, with Gramoxone, we used 20, um, um, 17 and 21 ounces and the activity was immediate. This is a picture from weed control one day after treatment. The picture on the right is with Liberty, that's about seven days after treatment. And you can see where we got activity corresponds to the, the width of the boom. Um, the, the, the hoods are about 16 inches and um, the hood runs right along the ground, right along the soil surface and um, it protects the sugar beet, or in this case, weeds that are growing in the row with sugar beets. We did another set of experiments that considered yield, and we saw no difference in sugar beet yield from application of either um, Gramoxone or Liberty um, application at the two to four, six to eight, 10 to 12 leaf stage compared to our glyphosate control. And these were in weed-free conditions. So this is, this is a true safety experiment. Now, we did see, um, we tended to see um, less yield from application at the two to four leaf stage. And I think part of this is, from lear is about learning to use a hooded sprayer. We've got to keep those hoods on the ground. So what we've requested in a 24C application for both Liberty and, and, and glufosinate, or excuse me, and gramoxone, is an application from six leaf sugar beet through the 12 leaf sugar beet stage. Next idea. So it's, it's using asafluorophin and sugar beets. 
So these are the results of, of experiments at Moorhead. These are experiments that were done over two years. And the first line is two Roundup sprays. Um, and you can see that we had less than 60% weed control in these experiments. Now, compare that to 16 ounces of Blazer in combination with Power Max. And you can see that we were in the 80, 85 to 90% range. So we know that Blazer controls pigweed, okay? And just a couple of pictures from the field. Um, all the dark green in the picture on the left is water hemp. So you can see the advantage that we got from adding the Ultra Blazer to the mixture. Now, um, we don't normally harvest our weed control trials, but we did elect to harvest this experiment. And um, what the, the, the numbers on the bottom are, are the percent change in either root yield or recoverable sucrose from adding blazer in the tank compared to the Roundup alone applications. So the weed control, the opportunity to recover some of that yield that we would have lost with inferior weed control was very significant in, in this particular experiment. We have other tolerance experiments that, that uh, Emma Burt is managing. And what, what the data is telling us is that once again, we've got to stay away from the application at the two leaf stage. Um, but application beyond six leaves gives us no differences in, in sugar beet yield and recoverable sucrose as compared to our, our Roundup control. So there's several different ideas we've talked about here. And I wanna use this slide to talk about the pros and cons of each of these. So using Roundup. So I want you to use Roundup. The key here is you've gotta be out there on small weeds. In a row cultivation, I want you to cultivate, um, but watch out for, for Rhizoctonia crown rod. The hooded sprayer. We need those 24 seed labels. We expect to get those. We don't have them yet. And myself and the agriculturalists will keep you posted on that. However, we need specialized equipment for that particular um, um, application. The weed zapper, we get good water hemp control. Our control isn't as good with um, kochia. Um, but as I mentioned, we, we have to, um, we, we see weed interference before we can use the equipment. And then once again, we have to purchase equipment. And then with Ultra Blazer, we're working on a Section 18 label. Um, that work is in progress. We submitted the first draft to MDA last week. And what we're going to target is glyphosate plus Ultra Blazer application after the 10 leave stage. So we want to be very, very careful with the last one and make sure that we learn more about sugar beet safety before we, we um, expand that label. Now, I'm not going to talk about this. This is an example of a slide where you need to take a picture. And what it is, it's weed control in the ro rotation. It's, it's weed control in soybean pre, um, soybean post-emergence, and corn. So there's a lot of ideas here. Some of these ideas may fit in your rotation. Some of them may not. But what these programs are, are programs that get water hemp control. What about, what about in wheat? Well, wheat does an excellent job of smothering out water hemp early in the season. My challenge with wheat is after harvest especially for those that want to keep the residue on the surface. They don't want to um, do any tillage. Um, it's amazing to me how quickly the water hemp comes back into the stubble. So we looked at Roundup. We looked at combinations of Roundup. We looked at Roundup 2,4-D. We looked at Roundup in combination with Sharpen and with MSO. And then Sharpen plus Valor. Um, plus Power Max. 
And what we saw early on, boy, that Roundup Plus Sharpen program really, really looked good. And we saw results immediately. But if you wait, you know, by 21 days, by three weeks, there was no difference between the Sharpen treatment and the, the 2,4-D um, mixture with, with PowerMax. I don't personally believe you need to mix Sharpen and Valor together. While the labels would suggest that this is an acceptable application, we have some experience with Valor and sometimes it carries over. So I, I wanna be very, very careful with suggesting that we use Valor um, on, on uh, wheat stubble, especially with sugar beet in the rotation. A quick update on Palmer amaranth. So in North Dakota, we've, we have a lot of challenges with water hemp or with Palmer amaranth, especially in Southeast North Dakota. So what the green bars represent is, is uh, 2020. So you can see we picked up three counties in 2020 alone. In addition, we saw a second field in right, uh, Richland County. So this is very concerning and we're, um, extension is, is continuing to very, very carefully manage and to make sure we understand the movement of Palmer amaranth. In Minnesota, the story is a little better. So we had a number of counties, but by and large, we have, we have eliminated Palmer amaranth from all but three counties due to a very aggressive program by Minnesota Department of Ag. So the three counties that they're still watching are, are the two counties in the Southeast corner, and then also Lincoln County um, along the South Dakota border. Very quickly, we've uh, made a, um, a, a change with Stinger. We used to talk about two ounces, maybe three ounces. Um, we'd like to increase that from, from um, two to three ounces to three to four ounces of Stinger um, in combination with glyphosate for common ragweed control. So we've seen more common ragweed concerns. I've, I've looked at more common ragweed samples during the greenhouse season than we have water hemp. So we think we need to adjust the rates and we're gonna do that um, throughout the valley. And then the last slide I have, I wanna give you a very quick update on HT2 sugar beet. And this is a, a new trait. This is a biotech trait that combines glyphosate, dicamba, and liberty. Um, we're going to have the opportunity in 2021 to start evaluating the weed control program. So we're excited for that opportunity. Um, we'll have several years to evaluate weed control because we don't anticipate an approval until the 2026 season. So KWS will be uh, commercializing that um, technology and they'll be using the, tra uh, the commercial name Truvera. And then once they get regulatory approval, they'll be licensing it to other, other seed companies. Lots of people have contributed to our research. Um, we can't do our research without the help of, of our grower cooperators the universities and the cooperatives. So like my colleagues, I thank you very much for your support. And, and my contact information, hopefully everybody has this. If you don't, please take a picture of it and don't be shy about calling me or, or following me on Twitter. And then finally, Mohammed, here are the, the um, codes so that you can click on these and, and get credit for attending um, this session. And Muhammad, I lost a little time in the beginning because of uh, technology, but if there's a question or two, I'll try to answer it in the few minutes that I have left. Tom, uh, I had to step away for a sec, but uh, there is a question in the chat box. I don't know if you saw that one, but uh, in case you didn't, uh, what rates of ethyl plus metolachlor are best for pre-use? Yes. 
So if, if you're go going to use the combination, so ethyl plus dual magnum, the only rate that I would recommend that you use is two pints of ethyl plus a half pint of dual magnum. If you're going to use ethyl alone, I would start at the two pint rate and you can go all the way up. You can do two, three, four pints. Um, if you have kosher concerns in your field, I would recommend six and seven pints. Here's the thing with ethyl though, you're not gonna get season long water hemp control. On the dual magnum side or, or esmetolachlor, um, if you have higher organic matter soils, um, you can go up to three quarters of a pint pre-emergence, but I don't want you to go any higher than three quarters of a pint. And I would prefer that the only people that use three quarters of a pint are those that have three and a half percent organic matter. There's one more question, Tom, Go for ahead. you. Go ahead. Um, is section 18 blazer only for Roundup? Have you dared mixed in stinger in for ragweed? We're not ready for that yet. So what we're going to do, what we're proposing to do is a Roundup plus ultra blazer plus non-ionic surfactant mixture. So 16 ounces of ultra blazer and then um, non-ionic surfactant. So we don't want even, we don't even want an oil in that mixture. And, um, and we wanna make that application after the 10 leaf stage. So we're gonna do, we're gonna continue to evaluate different combinations we're just not comfortable with going any further than, than that recommendation for 2021. And I wanna say this, we still have to get the approval. So that's what we've applied for with, uh, with the respective states, Minnesota and North Dakota. So for everybody, what Tom is saying, do not go start using Blazor as yet. Do not go start using Blazor until it's approved. And, right, and, since, and since you mentioned that, Muhammad, and that goes for the Liberty and the, the Grimox zone as well, we still need to secure those 24C labels. All right, check with your agriculturists before you use any of these products. So thank you, Tom. Thank you. Uh, as we indicated, if you have any questions, feel free. Go into the chat box, put your question there, and Tom will get back to you uh, during the presentation or after the um, final presentation. So our next speaker will be Dr. Mark Botel, and he will tell you all you need to know about control of insects in sugar beet. So uh, thanks everyone for attending. Um, I'll be uh, covering mainly, or focusing mainly on three insect uh, groups, uh, lagus bugs, grasshoppers, and a little bit on uh, sugar beet root maggot. Um, Dr. Metzger asked me to uh, speak on them a little bit, uh, and that's, uh, yeah, so you've had a little bit of a root maggot activity on the northern edges of your uh, growing area. So want to make sure we uh, we cover that a little bit as well. Uh, the insects are kind of uh, unique in your area because uh, uh, there aren't huge numbers of you that have lots of insect problems, but lots of you have a few insect problems. So um, that will uh, hopefully have something uh, interesting and helpful to, to everyone. So I'll uh, start off with the root maggot, just to show you what we're seeing with uh, root maggot population trends. Uh, the thing to point out here, uh, as you can see on the far right uh, for 2020, these are on a per trap basis for the entire Red River Valley. As you can see, the orange line is showing a, the trend line has been up for a long time. We've had some success years where we've kept them down uh, under 100 uh, cumulative, um, but we'd really like to have them more like uh, around 40 or 50. So uh, the average in 2020 was 194. That's the second highest in that 14 year period. So uh, we've got work to do on that. Uh, certainly that's mainly in the uh, central and northern parts of the valley, but I'll show you in a moment that uh, we've got some concerns in your area as well. Uh, this next slide is a animation slide. So I'll show you what our uh, risk looked like in 2017. And then I'll animate it 
through to 2020, what the forecast map looked like. And our forecasts end up being pretty accurate, actually. So this reflects really what was seen in the season as well. Then I'll move to our actual forecast for 2021. As you can see, I'll go back and forward. In uh, 2021, uh, we're expecting, uh, as you saw, the black areas didn't necessarily increase a lot. They increased maybe in frequency, but what did increase was the moderate risk and, and the, the severe risk didn't really, or the high risk didn't really uh, reduce at all. So uh, as you can see down here is southeast of Fargo, the Baker, Sabin, um, Barnesville area those are areas the nor northern area of your uh, your cooperative uh, acres uh, we had a kind of a little bit of i wouldn't call it an explosion but uh, a uh, significant increase in activity last year so that's something to watch out for you growers in that area uh, these blue boxes that i just popped up those typically i can squeeze in moderate and high risk but the last three years i haven't had room for all the locations that are um, for both high and, and uh, moderate risk. So uh, these are the high risk areas for Minnesota and North Dakota. And this next slide shows where we're expecting moderate risk. And there's your uh, Baker and Sabin of uh, focus for this uh, location, for this uh, presentation location. So something to watch out for if you've got a moderate rate of an insecticide on at planting, or you've got a seed treatment on, you still need to be wary and watch out. I'll be uh, sharing information through the crop and pest report. Uh, we can also do um, text messages through your agriculturist or your ag staff uh, if we see uh, something going on. The other thing you can do is watch for the fly counts online. They're very easy to find if you search for NDSU root maggot fly counts. So we post them every three days uh, throughout the uh, root maggot activity period online. So uh, do check that out and contact me if you're having trouble finding it. Uh, this next slide uh, is not as exciting as some of those that uh, my colleagues shared in the earlier presentations. And uh, there's a point to that. Um, if you look at that closely, you probably can't see a whole lot of uh, difference between the various treatments we have there. Um, the two far left uh, boxes uh, on top left uh, counter at the moderate rate, uh, Pancho Beta, those perform at similar levels, um, but you really can't see much going on here. And I would argue that even when you look at the untreated check, there's not a whole lot of difference that's visible above ground. This was a moderately infested area uh, near Thompson where we did some trials uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, you can see it maybe a little bit of thin or uh, not quite as nice a canopy closure with the check, but that's really about it. Um, but this drives a point home. This is what the roots look like. If you look over here at the untreated check on the far right, those uh, some of those lost the tap root. Uh, they're not going to produce a whole lot of tonnage or or sugar, recoverable sugar. Um, and uh, you can kind of see some subtle differences between the moderate rates of uh, or moderately performing products and then adding a full rate of uh, Lors Band Advanced or Lors Band 4E, we get a, a little better looking roots. But what's really telling is the yield. Um, all of those combination treatments where we had at plant protection plus a sprayable um, application of uh, Lors Band at either one or two pints were uh, produced uh, very nice yields. And uh, for this slide and then any others where I have statistics showing uh, these with these uh, groupings, uh, letters um, indicating significance, basically anytime two treatments share a letter, they only have to have one letter in common. They are not statistically different from each other. So for your convenience, I put the blue rectangle up there just to show you that those top four treatments are not statistically different from each other with regard to sucrose per acre or tons per acre. So we got good performance out of all those 
And even under that moderate pressure, this is actually a three-year study, 2016 to 2018. But uh, even under that moderate pressure, just putting on some form of at plant protection easily paid for itself. Uh, these uh, dollar figures, they look small. That's just the dollars per acre gained above the untreated check. Uh, next, I'll uh, uh, cover a little bit on lagus bug management. That's probably of most uh, concern for uh, many of you the last couple of years. I've seen uh, rising uh, lagus bug infestations as well, especially in neighboring uh, fields that neighbor uh, alfalfa production. Uh, just a little bit about the biology of this pest. It's actually a, a complex of different species, but we mainly have one called the tarnished plant bug. Um, they're all in the same genus. Uh, they overwinter as adults. Uh, and uh, so the what the winter ends up being, if we have a heavy snow winter that's mild uh, in temperature, uh, we get uh, good or depending on how you look at it, bad, you know, good success on the part of the lagus bugs uh, surviving. Um, what happens in sugar beets is they'll move in late summer after other crops and weed species are, are senescing or drying down. So that's uh, early to mid-August, maybe even early September when you see the buildups. They lay eggs in the petioles, the, the adults do, and then those hatch into what we call nymphs. And there are five instars when they're in the nymph stage. And all the while they are feeding uh, all uh, both stages, uh, damaging the plant. Uh, typically we have two generations per year in Minnesota and North Dakota, but in years where we have an early mild spring where those adults become active early, we sometimes get to a third generation. Lagus bugs are known to prefer to feed on uh, small seeded broadleaf weeds and uh, other uh, plants. Uh, and the zones that they feed on are mainly the, uh, the zones of high, high growth, uh, high uh, meristematic uh, tissue development. And so on sugar beets, they'll feed on the, on the crown area. They use uh, piercing and sucking mouth, mouth parts to damage and feed on the plot, the uh, plant. And when they do that, they actually salivate down a salivation, a salivary channel in their mouth, within their mouth parts. And uh, they inject uh, this saliva, which uh, liquefies plant tissue. And then they suck the, the exudate that comes out of the, the wound area. Uh, as I mentioned, both stages injure the plant and symptoms can vary but most telltale is going to be leaf curling and these bumps along the petioles as well as uh, the uh, midrib of the of the leaves. And since they are a sap feeding type of insect, uh, they do reduce carbohydrates uh, directly but also indirectly because the plant is going to be responding late season by putting out new growth in response to that in response to that injury. Just a few more uh, pictures here of what the uh, the injury symptomology can look like. There's more of that uh, blackening. By the way, this exudate that comes out of the plant, uh, that's not necessarily the saliva. That that is a uh, what happens is it, it's a oxidation process that uh, turns that sap uh, black uh, on uh, contact to to air to oxygen. Um, in severe infestations, you'll also see some lip leaf tip burning, uh, but that's not always a telltale sign. Certainly uh, other things can cause that, so you really need to inspect closer. Uh, I want to show you just a little bit of data on a trial or a, uh, an experiment that was done by one of my former master's students. He was looking at intercrop movement between sugar beet uh, sunflower and uh, several other crops that are grown in rotation with beets. And uh, the emphasis today, I'll just show you uh, because there is uh, some uh, increased alfalfa production, I'll just show you what's happening, 
people what can happen between uh, those two systems, sugar beet and alfalfa. Um, because these crops have different differing canopies, and um, especially between things like alfalfa and sunflower, uh, Justin had to do sampling with uh, different methodology, different different methods to uh, assess populations, and with that he had to develop an, an analysis in consultation with uh, with statisticians, of course. But what he came up with was with a was a term called Z score, which is basically just a departure from the seasonal average. So this is a really busy chart, uh, but that's not really um, a big deal here. Uh, each line indicates, uh, we just want you to look at trends, by the way. Each line indicates a different location. He had six locations in this trial, this experiment over a couple of years. And what he saw, this is alfalfa. Uh, basically, the undulations in activity at all those sites had a lot to do with alfalfa cuttings. So we had one in late June, and then things really picked up in July, another cutting after that, and then uh, things picked up uh, later on, later on in August. And then they, they dropped off considerably. In some of those locations, they dropped off in mid-August or, or so. On sugar beet, uh, it somewhat corresponded with those drops late season. We didn't have much activity at all because uh, in early season because there was uh, there were weed seeds to feed on, flowering heads of weeds and other crops and alfalfa as well, which is constantly putting on new growth. But later season, they built up in sugar beet. So that's when we need to watch out for lagus bugs in our crop. So this kind of just makes the points that I've pretty well covered already, but in alfalfa, the cuttings really impact activity within the crop and later season that that um, that imp sort of uh, motivates the the or provides the stimulus for the in the adults to move on into sugar beet. So that's when we watch and we need to be really being careful with uh, or watching carefully what's going on with lagus, lagus bugs and beets. I'll show you uh, just a couple of data slides on lagus bug control and sugar beet. This first one was quite a few years ago, but it still applies to today. Uh, we were mainly looking at Asana and Lorsban 4E. And the main point here is that we saw that Asana was not so effective at lower rates. And I would say this probably applies to other uh, pyrethroids like Mustang. So we don't want to cut rates on pyrethroid insecticides for lagus bug control. We'd want to max that out. So with Asana, keep that at the 9.6 maximum rate per acre. And with Mustang, we'd keep that at four ounces. Um, with Lorsban, in this first uh, uh, study, we didn't really see, or in this study, we didn't see a major difference between the half pint and one pint, but I'll show you some more data that suggests the one pint might be more consistent. So in this trial, we wanted to look, uh, because uh, growers are, as you know, you prefer to uh, save a pass across the field when you can. So we wanted to look at combining lagus insecticides with Cercospora management fungicides. Uh, we had a fairly good infestation, not a stellar one, I would say, but uh, nearly two lagus bugs per plant. So uh, certainly worth uh, doing the trial. And although we didn't have every single combination you could think of, um, it, it, I think some important patterns showed up in this trial. Uh, this first slide is the survival of lagus bugs at 11 days after spraying. So it's insects per plant. Um, on the far left, we have the half pint of Lorsban. It's not a lot of lagus bugs surviving, but it is about double what was surviving with Lorsban 4E when we used uh, a one pint. 
So um, that suggests a little better control with one pint and a half. Um, and then uh, the colored bars, by the way, so on the base of each cluster of bars, we have the treatment rate for the insecticide, the base insecticide, and then either alone in the case of the half pint or with eminent for the yellow, with the yellow bar. And then super tin is indicated by the red bar on the far right of each cluster. Uh, we only actually had that with lanate. So with, with one pint of Lorsban, uh, we didn't have a negative impact on control. Uh, when we combined eminent with dibrome, we see that we actually had slightly better control by including the eminent, although that was not statistically significant. And then with lanate, it, we appear, appear to have had some kind of antagonism with both eminent and lanate, or sorry, with uh, eminent and super tin when we combined that either one of those with Lanny. So that's one thing to watch out for, to really avoid, I would say. When we took that to yield, uh, just comparing the half versus the one pint, we, the yield was statistically higher by using the full one pint. You can actually go up to two pints if you want, but I would say avoid using a half pint for managing lagus and sugar beet. Uh, maybe more concerning was the negative impacts by combining fungicides with these insecticides. With Lorsban at one pint, we had a significant loss in recoverable sucrose per acre when we added eminent to the as a tank mix. We had a similar pattern with eminent and dibrome, although that was not statistically different. So you can see these two bars are sharing a B. And then with lanate, uh, although it wasn't significant, we had we lost over a thousand pounds of sucrose by combining super tin with lanate. So eminent appears to be safer. It was actually numerically slightly more uh, sucrose yield there, not necessarily, you know, not declaring any difference there, but suggesting that there was no negative impact by adding the eminent. So that would probably be a safe combination as well. Uh, next we have, uh, I don't have data to show, I mean I have data but I'm not sharing all that data today be in the interest of time. But uh, what we've seen in other research that's not being, uh, not being shown is that uh, we had pretty substantial yield losses uh, by combining Lorsban between one and two pints per acre with eminent. So uh, if you're going to combine, then you probably would want to back that back down to a half pint of Lorsban or choose a different combination such as Lorsban 4E with headline, Dibrome with eminent. And uh, you know, what uh, uh, sorry, those are uh, negative. Those are losses. These are all what I would say are dangerous combinations, Lanny with super tin. And then we also had one study where we were looking at combining these treatments with uh, Roundup. And we, we also had uh, uh, pretty significant yield losses. So up to 20% with those combinations. Safer combinations we saw included Asana with Headline, Mustang Max with Quadrus, and Lanny with Eminent. So if you have Ligus uh, concerns in a field, uh, and what you want to do is randomly sample the field. You want to cover it well, and what you want to do is uh, randomly select that an individual plant at a time to count uh, without looking at whether it's a showing symptomology or not. You want to be random about that process. Uh, and as you're approaching that plant, um, you want to really approach it, you know, or have it picked out where when you're 10 to 15 feet 
out or so and then approach that plant and if you see adults leaving the plant then you want to count those and you kind of get used to what ligus bugs look like as you're in the field a little bit so that'll give you you'll, you'll have a good idea um, you need to positively ID as best you can though to be accurate uh, you want to inspect the whole plant but really zero in on the new growth area once the adults have kind of left the plant the nymphs are mainly going to be focused on or feeding on the new growth area in near the crown then you want to tally all all the uh, insects you've counted per the amount of plants and the economic threshold we have right now is that it's probably worth treating if your average exceeds not not up to one per plant but exceeds one bug per plant and uh, research that we've uh, done in the past uh, suggests that uh, insecticide applications that are made closer to harvest are probably not going to pay off you may be just as well to go ahead and and harvest that that field uh, I've got a list here you'll be able to download this uh, recording as well but uh, chlorpyrifos so far we still have it registered for use in sugar beets uh, it uh, works well you'd probably want to stick at the one pint if you can uh, Mustang Max I would also say keep it at the high rate and then dibrome is also registered for use in sugar beets. So that's that's another option as well. Uh, one thing I always like to point out with Mustang is that it's got a very long pre-harvest interval. So uh, those late season infestations um, are not going to be, uh, Mustang is probably not going to be a good option for managing them. Now these are insecticides that are specifically labeled for ligus bug control in sugar beet so we have the pest and the crop combination you are also legally permitted to use other insecticides on this second list the catch is that ligus control is not promised on or guaranteed on the label so you're kind of on your own if you use one of these insecticides and you have unsatisfactory performance uh, the manufacturer does not have to uh, stand behind you on on that so that's that's a consideration as well but all these have reasonable uh, pre-harvest intervals uh, for ligus bug uh, management so as far as uh, what to expect for 2021 I think most of us are experiencing a somewhat dry winter thus far as far as snowfall and insulation so maybe the weather is uh, is not only providing us good storage weather, beet storage weather, but it uh, it may be depressing some of the ligus in uh, survival as well. But that's yet to be determined. This is a fairly long stretch of below zero weather that we're experiencing, so that may help us. As I uh, pointed out before, it's usually mid to late summer. But we have seen, and I've talked to agriculturists in the MINDAC and the Southern MIN area as well, that have said they, they've seen outbreaks in, uh, in uh, mid-June. So watch out for them. Uh, keep an eye on your fields uh, earlier on in the season. And as I pointed out before with Asana, don't cut the rate if you're going to use that product. Uh, Lores band 4E or advanced or generics. You want to uh, make sure the formulation is the same as the two insecticides that we've used over the years, the four, four uh, pounds per gallon liquid. Uh, but you want to keep that at at least a pint of product per acre. And then with Mustang Max, again, don't cut the rate. And then Lanate, the application rate recommended is one pint per acre. Uh, you indicated in the survey today, as well as the folks that did do the uh, the earlier survey, that grasshoppers were an issue. I certainly got more phone calls this past year on grasshoppers than I have for a few years. So I'll talk just a little, just a few minutes about them. Uh, grasshoppers tend to be pretty sporadic, but uh, 
and and with that sporadicity uh, they're also the timing is somewhat in unpredictable they can in, impact depending on whether they're winter over or they're if they adult they overwinter as adults excuse me uh, they may get going earlier in the season uh, but they continue throughout the summer so if dry conditions uh, occur in the spring and persist through the summer we can have major grasshopper problems um, just a few more slides here um, both nymphs the immatures and the adults cause problems uh, the catch on that is that adults are much harder to control and they're also uh, more mobile so you want to try and get catch them when they're in the nymph stage Early season injury in sugar beets obviously is going to be the most concerned for us and the most costly to your pocketbook. Um, as far as an economic threshold, there really isn't one for sugar beets. So this is somewhat extrapolated that I'm going to show you from other crops of a similar value. Um, you'll have this uh, in your uh, recorded as well, but uh, basically uh, you can break it's broken down by either in the field or in the field margins you can take a whole lot more in the margins uh, obviously uh, so we really want to focus in on what's going on in the in the field and uh, one point on this is that uh, managing grasshoppers because of their lack of mobility when they're in the nymph stage um, you can actually sometimes, and, and the adults tend to kind of invade in sort of hop skip flights. So if you catch an infestation early, sometimes you can, what some people refer to as ring the field to, um, to uh, uh, control an infestation before it gets out of hand, especially if they're in the, if there aren't a lot of adults and they're mainly in the nymph stage. Uh, similar products are available. I, I've mainly focused here on this slide on what we, uh, the insecticides we know a lot about with regard to uh, grasshopper management. These products all work pretty well on grasshoppers. Again, thing, if uh, I guess another point to drive home or to repeat is Mustang will work fine. You just probably want to focus on that uh, more early season if you've got an outbreak. And as far as the variable rates, uh, the smaller the grasshopper, the lower rate you can probably get away with. But if you've got a lot of adults and they're, they're gonna be mobile, you wanna knock them down as soon as possible, you'd probably wanna maximize these rates out. So that ends the uh, informational part of this. Uh, I just want to wrap it up by saying that uh, I want to thank the Sugar Beet Research and Education Board for uh, providing funding to support my program over the years. I want to thank my technician, Jake Rickus, for his contributions in making sure the research goes well. And uh, I want to thank the seed and chemical industry as well for uh, providing products and seed for us to test and use in our trials. And I want to thank my colleagues at NDSU and the U of Minnesota for uh, collaborating on research and for helping with harvest as well, especially Dr. Ian McRae, with, who helped uh, a lot with the uh, Ligus bug management trials. And I will wrap it up. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, there are the two QR codes uh, for you to scan, and I'll leave that up and open it up for questions. Is there any regulatory update, Mark? Is there anything going on with uh, any of your products? Um, yes, uh, uh, thank you, Tom, for that question. And by the way, I've kind of lost control as far as uh, including my video, not that you need it necessarily, but uh, um, Yes, uh, there is a uh, comment period right now that uh, people can provide in, uh, their input on whether they would like chlorpyrifos to main, 
uh, registration to be maintained. So it's kind of another round of it. I would say, um, I'm, I guess I'm hopeful. I'm kind of an eternal optimist, but I'm also a realist. And I'm, I'm really concerned about whether we're going to have chlorpyrifos too much longer because with a new administration of a, I guess a different color, if you will, I'm not playing politics or being political, but it's a reality we all face that, uh, uh, you know, there may be more regulation and, and the environmentalist groups that uh, want to get rid of chlorpyrifos uh, are probably going to be knocking on the door of the current administration, especially as soon as uh, they approve a new EPA administrator, that certainly that ball could get rolling again. So that is a concern. There was one question that came in. If you compare the triazoles, can you start with indicating uh, the most efficacious versus the least efficacious? As I indicated in my presentation, depending on the year, uh, even when it's wet, all of them work poorly. When it's dry, I will say number one is probably Proline, followed by Inspire, then maybe Minerva and Provisol, Lucento. However, we're not recommending that you use any one of these products alone. Do not use any one of these products alone. Mix them for the most part with an EBDC or a copper and you will have pretty good, good to excellent control. Good to excellent control with a triazole and either a copper or an EBDC. Um, if you go to Southern Main website, they had their presentations earlier. You will see that Proline was also working fairly well, very well up there as well. But all the cops, we're all recommending you use mixtures. Other questions, chat. Dr. Metz, got any comment for, from uh, Mendak area? No, we're pretty quiet down here. Nice and cold, beets are freezing, and the factory's slicing. So I can't think of anything better than to worry about today. Yeah, other than missing your rolls, um, it's better to kind of be from home. I don't have to wake up too early to travel, but I'm missing your uh, debonair hair and face. So <laughs> grow it a little bit more next time I see you. Yeah, I have a, a face for radio and a voice for newspaper. I'll leave it. <laughs> hey, Mark, do you want to take uh, Scott's question about springtails in the Fargo area? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, springtails are uh, difficult to uh, difficult to uh, predict. There, it's very uh, sporadic, also, and not to overuse that word, but it's difficult to predict where and when they're going to pop out but uh um they one thing i would say is uh if you're either on ground that you've had springtail problems before or if you're uh, in a going to be planting beets into an area uh neighboring a field that that had springtails in in the recent past um, you'd probably want to have some sort of uh, insecticidal uh, protection on uh, one thing I could probably mention, too, is that uh, so far in the, I, I occasionally get a question about rumors about seed treatments not quite performing as well as uh, as granular or as a counter, essentially. Um, and that's mainly out in the Mondac area, Montana, North Dakota border. Uh, that, but they have a different species complex out in that area. We're working on the genetics of that complex right now with, in a collaboration with USDA. Um, but they, yeah, they are having problems. Some growers would refer to it as failures of the seed treatments, the neonicotinoid seed treatments to manage springtails in that, that area. So that is uh, a concern. But as far as within the uh, North Dakota, uh, Eastern North Dakota and, uh, and Minnesota, um, probably, uh, they, they overwinter very well in cold winters. We don't really see, seem to see, uh, uh, negative impacts from open cold winters on springtail survival. 
uh, they actually get active very early when soils are quite cold. So um, probably going to be similar to last year, just spots here and there. Mark Bloomquist, you guys doing okay in the south, Pro processing and cold weather? Very grateful for the cold weather down here. Um, processing's going all right, uh, but uh, we have a, quite a ways to go, so the cold weather should uh, uh, help us get there, I think. And for all the growers at Mindac, if you had gone up to Southern Mind this past growing season, we know that they usually have a lot of sarcospora, probably more than anybody else, but their fields were the greenest that I've seen this entire season. There are a lot of brown fields in the Mindac, in the Mindac and even American Crystal area in the northern areas at Southern Min, they did a phenomenal job. So hopefully your fields will look like that with fungicides and with improved varieties as well. Your sugar went up, your tonnage went up. So we hope you guys use all the recommendations to have a great crop this coming season. It's already February, by the time you know it, you'll be planting in April. So best of luck to everybody. Anything else Ashok? Tom. Yeah, just a slight correction from my presentation. So the latest got supplemental label actually in early 2021. So, but I'm going to change that in, in my slides when I share with Mindac. So. Yeah, they're going to use it now. So yeah, you don't have to worry too much. Yep. Got it guys, how are the agriculturists? Any questions from the agriculturists? While you're thinking, I guess I have one other comment in relation to Tom's question about regulatory things. Uh, some of you probably are aware last summer was the first season that MIDAC was registered. So that's another option for at plant uh, insect management. And what we've seen thus far, at least with regard to root maggots, we really haven't been able to test it very long. Uh, but we've got three years worth of testing on root maggots. It's a it labeled for soil application, so at plant. Um, but we've gotten uh, performance at a level against the root maggot, at least, that's comparable to that moderate rate of counter. Not the it's probably out, usually outperformed by the uh, maximum rate of counter, but it's um, it's kind of a mid-range performing uh, product, I guess I would say. And uh, that company also has another insecticide that they're pursuing registration on called Bifender, which is a bifenthrin formulation. And uh, that's from the same company, Vive Crop Protection, that uh, um, I guess they're probably, they're, you might say they're, they're not a huge company, but their, their niche probably is uh, developing formulations that work well with with uh, 10340 starter fertilizer. And both of those formulations are, are compatible with starter. While Mohammed is doing that, I, I did notice in the survey that you completed today that uh, insecticide use was up. That was probably the grasshopper stuff mainly, but some cutworms as well. Uh, some were 75% of you that used insecticides to manage ligus. Uh, said you were unsure of the performance, which is reasonable, uh, but it might, if you were disappointed in your performance at all, uh, it, you meant 50% uh, of you that used an insecticide for lagus bug management um, used the between six and 10 uh, gallons per acre as a spray output volume. And with lagus nymphs feeding down in the crown when it's a full canopy crop, you may want to up that water to somewhere around 15. I did actually even go 20, but I know that comes down to volume issues for hauling water and refilling and that kind of thing. But I would bump it up to at least 15 GPA. 